two of our members today, Raisa Basani is not here, and Pat Engl English is in England. <laughs> so she is not here for this meeting. Um, but we do have a quorum. So I would like to ask Don Tibbetts to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Media. Not yet. <laughs> Although sometimes they're watching in the other room. And of course, we have our wonderful people upstairs at VTV. Uh, <clears throat> can I get a motion to approve the agenda, or is there any uh, changes that need to be done to the agenda? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mary. Uh, 11C, uh, resolution to record a lien. Mm -hmm. Should be 947 455 60. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Uh, I would bring your attention to 14H. The Resident Advisory Committee will meet March 15th, this Thursday, not April 19th. It will meet April 19th as well, but we will be meeting this month, this Thursday, March 15th. <coughs> yes. The Landscape Committee, that's F just above it, will mm -hmm. be meeting April 26th. Instead of the 12th? April 26th, not the 12th, for okay. the landscape. Very good. Any other additions, corrections, changes? All right. Uh, do I have a, a consensus? Is there anybody against it? All right, we will approve it without objection. Uh, approval of the minutes <clears throat> of February 13th, all 47 pages. Do I have any additions, corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve? I so move. All right. I second. Okay, then we approve without objection. All right, uh, <clears throat> report of the chair. Uh, first of all, we moved up our report from Director Agricar on the Disaster Preparedness Task Force because normally it comes at the very end of the meeting and a lot of people miss it. And it's a very important, and he has some really important things to say this time uh, about what's happening in, in that. So uh, before we get to that, it is with great reluctance and regret that I announce that we are losing Director Stephen Leonard, who is going to resign as of our next meeting. So we are putting out a call to people who would like the interim appointment to replace him. I uh, see Catherine Lassiter up in the general manager's office, and she has applications that will do, be due back on March 30th by noon. And we will appoint somebody, I won't say take his place, take his seat uh, at our April meeting. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Director Akrakar, would you give us the disaster preparedness task force? Thank you, Madam uh, uh, President. <clears throat> Let me start out saying that disaster preparedness is the responsibility of each and every one of us <clears throat> for the whole entire Laguna Woods family. That said, let me say Chief Moy and the lady supporting him, Debbie Ballesteros, are doing so much for our community that the Orange County disaster preparedness teams are looking at us for directions and trying to understand our program, our, our layout. Chief Moy has already submitted application to Orange County Health Agency for partnership in the POD, or Point of Distribution Program. Uh, this program allows Laguna Woods Village to pick up medical supplies from designated locations for our use during a major disaster. 
we participate in a training exercise with them to evaluate how we could best handle distribution and control of the medicines, medication. GRF security and access committees has, all, has been asked to investigate specifications for large backup emergency generators that would be able to supply power needed for operate, operating under disaster situations. Please note, if the community center building were to fail in an emergency, which can happen, either the security building or gate 12 area would act as the backup emergency operation centers or EOCs. We have budgeted $16,000 for disaster preparedness supplies, storage cabinets, first aid, CPR, AED, uh, resident classes, printing flyers, building captain, uh, good neighbor building captain folders and supplies, as well as emergency items to be sold at the cost to residents. A disaster task force radio drill was conducted on February 26th, uh, and 12 out of 13 radios responded, which means our system is acting pretty good. In case of emergency, the backup radio operators were instructed to use the phrase, phrase break, 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 to interrupt radio traffic for dire emergency. Enclosed in the packet, you will see uh, a form <coughs> for medical volunteer registration. I'm, I'm talking about this form here. Uh, packets are available as well as there is uh, copies up there. Uh, residents with medical background such as doctors, uh, paramedics, nurses, etc. are urged to participate in, a training, in training programs. They are also made aware of the Good Samaritan law and the privacy policy in regard to their help, helping hand. Uh, in case of disaster, that is very important that we have medical assistance as well. Good neighbor building captains are encouraged to attend class once a year at least as a refresher and have for updates in their program. <clears throat> Debbie Ballesteros is editing a Google map with color code to pinpoint where we need more GNBCs or good neighbor building captains. United President Juanita Skillman gave kudos to VMS Security for the good job they did in handling the unfortunate incident, uh, you know which one I'm talking about, last month, and stress, stressed that G GNBC should not risk their lives in any such situations. To conclude, let me add that we, are, we all need to act, actively get involved and be ready and prepared before a disaster event takes place. For sake of ourselves and our neighbor residents, and let us give a big hand for our excellent security and management team, headed by Tim Moy and Brad Hudson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Archer. Now, <clears throat> I'd just like to emphasize with this uh, medical sheet, you are not volunteering a lot of time. If there is a disaster, we need to know who in our community has medical background. And that's all you're doing is telling us, I'm a doctor, I'm a former nurse, I'm a paramedic, whatever, so that if we need to call on you, because we can't get outside assistance, that we would be able to do so. It's just basically a register. Thank you. All right, we will now have open forum, <clears throat> and this is uh, members may address the board of directors regarding items that are not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors. In other words, it is not a GRF issue or a third issue. It is an issue that we can handle. There's a maximum time limit of three minutes, and it will show on your clock there. And the speaker may only address the board once. It's not a debate or discussion. The board reserves the right to limit the amount of time, but we, I think, looking at the audience today, three minutes is going to be just fine. If you have not already signed up, a little pink slip, please do so and give it to Cheryl 
It makes it much easier if we can call people up by name and know what their name is and their manor number is, rather than having people have to stand in line. Okay, Cheryl, who is our first member? Our first speaker is Chris Collins. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Chris Collins, you. I'm here to give another update on the work of the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village on behalf of qualified residents in need of temporary financial emergency assistance. The more things change, the more they stay the same. One of those um, constants is the need of some Laguna Woods residents for emergency financial assistance. Some residents face a temporary financial crisis. Others simply outlive their money. Since its inception over 20 years ago, the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village has been responding to the emergency financial needs of residents with assistance from medication, utility bills, grocery vouchers, nursing care, medical and dental bills, among other things. The need for such help continues. To keep the Foundation viable in the future, we need help. While donations today help the Foundation meet personal needs, present needs, Leaving a bequest will, will permit the Foundation to continue its mission in the future. To do so will cost you nothing today, but specifying a continuing donation in a will or trust to the Foundation can mean emergency help to residents for years to come. Please remember as well that retirement accounts such as IRA, 401k, and 403b plans can be subject to ordinary tax and estate tax. From 40 to 60% can go to taxes if left to your heirs. Retirement plan assets left to the foundation will transfer tax-free. In planning your estate, consider leaving a portion of your retirement plan to a charity such as the foundation and leave more favorably taxed assets to your family. Please be sure to discuss any IRA-related actions with your CPA or financial or professional tax advisor before acting. If you feel any of these giving ideas are appropriate, we suggest you contact your financial and or legal advisor or the Foundation of Legal Woods, Laguna Woods Village at 949-268-2246 or the foundation at comline.com. Thank you for your generous and continuing support of the mission of the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village. Thank you, Chris, and we appreciate the foundation. Next speaker, please, Cheryl. Our next speaker... I'm sorry, is John Beckett. Two weeks ago, I attended a celebration of the life of Tony Dower. Tony had many friends, and more than 100 of us were able to attend. I met Tony's wife, Barbara, and I listened as his three sons, Don, James, and Andy, spoke of the love and admiration they felt for him. Tony's son, Don, described his father as the kindest and most generous man he'd ever known. Son James praised Tony for the sacrifices he made and for his love and commitment. Son Don said, it was an honor and a privilege to have Tony for a father. All of his sons agreed that the most important thing in Tony's life was his family. They said Tony worked hard to set a good example for them. Tony set a good example by being a faithful and loving husband. Tony and Barbara were married for 50 years. All of Tony's sons are committed to their marriage, just as Tony was. Tony set a good example by being a good and devout Christian. Tony was a member of Saddleback Church, and he attended services every Sunday. Tony also practiced his faith, practiced his faith in his daily life. Tony fed the hungry by delivering meals to those in need. Tony made the word of God available to travelers as an active member of the Gideon Society. All of Tony's sons are committed to their faith, just as Tony was. I had the honor of serving with Tony on this board back in 2014. 
When I first met Tony, I was impressed with his honesty. As I came to know him, my admiration grew. Tony taught science to high school students. The qualities that made Tony a good teacher also made him a good director. He had common sense, he was sincere, and he was humble. Tony was a sensitive man with tender feelings. When he was criticized by his fellow directors, it broke his heart. I will never forget Tony Dower and the sacrifice he made for us. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Next speaker, please. Okay. Next up is Linda Borgs. Borges. Good morning. I'm here on uh, behalf of the concerned members of Cul-de-Sac 24, uh, and it's concerning the removal of the washing machine and laundry room 89 and 90. Uh, I have a petition from some of the members, um, which I can turn into you uh, later, uh, the residents of La Laguna Hills Mutual. They would like the washing machine we had or a similar washing machine returned to the laundry room, 89 and 90. In response to the important notice posted in the laundry room that you're seeking opportunity to, opportunities to conserve energy and contribute to the environment, we applaud you. But taking away a washing machine to do so is not only contradictory to common sense, but is ludicrous. The number of people using the laundry facilities has not changed. So now we're going to use the remaining machines even more, only to put more wear and tear on the remaining machines. How does this conserve energy? And I might add that last night a neighbor went down to do his laundry. We had three machines left and one of them went out and there were two people waiting for machines last night. Second, you just doubled the cost for the residents to use the washing machine from 50 cents to a dollar, which makes no sense since you just installed numerous solar panels that would not only run the outside light, but is also totally covered, would cover the laundry facilities. As members of this co-op, we would like to know where the saving of these solar panels are going. Also attached, I have it uh, attached here as page six from the 2018 annual budget report, whereas solar panel replacement with a 20-year life cost $2,300,000. Was this really good use of our funds? Where is the line item for our California rebate for the budget? That might be in here, but I can't find it. Getting back to the important notice, it stated that if we had questions to call 949-597-4600, the neighbors around the laundry, 90, decided to each call and let the office know of our frustration regarding the removal of the washing machine. I was told that this was not the number to call and that a letter to the board was the only way to report our concern. Secondly, sincerely, that's sincerely, was written by our co-op. And I can turn in the petition. Okay. Thank you. Would you give it to the corporate secretary? All right. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Next speaker. OK, our next speaker is Jeannie Braddon. Great. Um, my name is Jeannie Braden at 199 Unit B. Um, I went to a meeting uh, last month and got the okay to try to find about getting a tower from Verizon because we're having problems with phone reception. And my results is they are now developed something that is small enough to be put in a building. There can be several of them. And Verizon would like Laguna Woods to be the first to have them. They will uh, boost, they grab the signal and boost the signal so we will get better signal from Verizon. I have sent in a form that you guys can fill out and start the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. OK, our next speaker is Dick Rader. Good morning, Dick Rader, 270D. 
the TV signal wasn't on when the uh, meeting started, and I wondered if you wanted to mention again that you have a call for applicants for a uh, position on the board. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Judy Rizzo. I had a response to the disaster responding uh, committee. Is, is that going to be out of order? No, that's fine. Oh, okay, good. I'm Judy Rizzo, 468D, Kaya Cadiz. Um, as a member of the disaster task force, I want to give a call out to all of my sisters and brothers who are nurses um, and to say that their services would be very much appreciated. We as nurses have always helped people and we're used to emergencies, we're used to crises, so I think this would be a wonderful role for nurses and, of course, for doctors and EMT workers and anyone like that, but I would just like to see more nurses get on the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Our next speaker is Jack Arnold. Jack Arnold, 404D. And <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. At uh, gate one, could we please consider or make the same arrangements going exiting as they have at gate five, which is right turn lane, right turn only? Um, it's very frustrating to be in the right lane and nobody, nobody moving when there's no traffic because the person's waiting for the light so they can go straight across. Uh, they have it at five, and it would be greatly appreciated if we had it. Uh, another thing is that <clears throat> I leave to go to get a coffee about 5.30 to 5.45 every morning, and I notice that in our cul-de-sac, there are seven to ten empty parking spots in the carports, yet the, car, the cul-de-sac is almost filled with cars so long as the houses. I mean, it's nice to be able to get close to your house, but if they're not being used, is there anything we can do about it? Maybe we could rent them out and make some money from it. Uh, and uh, one last question. How many vehicles per household? Because at one time it was two, then the next time I heard it was three. And uh, in United, is there a, a set number? If there is, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. Okay, that concludes our speakers. All right, thank you very much, Cheryl. <clears throat> All right, we will do responses uh, from the board, and you will also be limited to three minutes, and the uh, clock will be on there so that you can see. Are there any responses? And I'll start over here, Steve. I <clears throat> um, hope I can get this all in in three minutes. <clears throat> um, to Linda at 531P on the laundries. Um, laundry usage in United is down 25% over the course of about the last six or seven years, according to an analysis I did. Um, and I verified the reduction of income also with the uh, applications to alterations for permits for washers and dryers being installed in uh, individual manners. And right now, uh, or I should say about a year ago, that number for the permit applications was also about 25%. So the two numbers go hand in hand in concert. Um, regarding the raise in the fee from 50 cents to a dollar in the washers, um, it costs on an operating basis about $2 per load to do laundry in the community. Um, collecting 50 cents, we were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Taking it to a dollar cut our losses by about a third of what they are. And there has been discussion and recommendation to install dryers that will also collect coins so that the operating expenses for the laundries 
will be covered by the people who use them. The equipment that is replaced in the laundries is done through reserve funding out of your assessments. And in part of the analysis, what was clearly shown is that there were only seven laundry rooms out of 175 where machines did two to two and a half loads per day. So less than 168 laundries did less than two loads of wash per machine per day. Well, if you have four machines in a laundry room that do eight loads for an entire day or less, you don't need four machines. Three machines can more than adequately take up what's necessary for the eight loads that are being done. On the uh, solar, the 20 year life is only the warranty on the panels. Solar systems that are installed continue to produce up to 80% or 90%, depending on the equipment, of what their original installation performance was well into their 40th year. So uh, it, it's not a 20 year piece of equipment. It will continue to produce electricity and the savings from the power company, from SCE, will, are being used to offset the cost of the equipment until the ROI is produced. And then we will see significant savings after um, those expenses have been met. So I hope that, uh, oh, by the way, laundry rooms 89 um, and 90. Uh, laundry room 89 takes in about um, 70, does about 70 loads per month, and 90 does about 123. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. <clears throat> Gary? Any comments to responses? Any responses to comments? I did, but come back to Come you. back to you, okay. Maggie, anything? I have nothing. Okay. <clears throat> Janie, no? Don? Yeah, and Jack Arnold made a, a point about that right turn out of gate one. I agree on that. I, I live on gate five, and I was always waiting for the car. Microphone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, talking about Jack Warner, uh, Jack uh, Arnold. He is uh, requesting us to look into a right turn only. Uh, that makes sense. It really does. I've seen cars backed up all, all the way back to the intersection, and that's something we'll look into. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Andre? I have no comment at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Cash? Thank you. Uh, let me start out saying we're going to lose a very good director. He had a lot of hand in considerable improvements in the uh, our whole village, uh, including the solar and the laundries, and we had to see him go. <clears throat> now, getting back to the work, Chris, you're doing an excellent job uh, getting uh, uh, foundation work and coming here every meeting and talking about it and <clears throat> improving uh, our village. I also have some comment on uh, laundry. Maybe we do need to look again at the increase in cost uh, from 50 cents to a dollar, even though it's a negative impact financially. The reason being is we had the laundry system uh, penalizing now, the, not the users, but the non-users somehow, because a lot of people use the laundry facility, like the caregivers, and they come in and use their laundries, and that's why this change was done, I think. Uh, <clears throat> next, I have some comments to Judy Ruizzo. It's really, thank you so much for talking about it. She is very active in the uh, disaster community as well. And we want to see volunteers such as her uh, get involved, all of you. And I see a better crowd this time. So maybe we should see even better crowd again so more people can get involved. It's all one big happy family. Uh, I agree with uh, 
Arnold on the right turn lane at gate one, but I don't know if there's enough room for making that lane individually for right turn. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but there are two lanes that are going straight. Don't need three. You don't, okay. All right, there's no, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe <coughs> no discussion, don't. please. Yeah. Uh, it's possible we, you know, we need to revisit it, and that's about all I have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Manuel? I have no comments. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Gary. Okay, I have a couple things for Disaster Prepared Task Force, and I'm all for it, and I'm also on the task force. What I do want to say is that maybe we need to take a look at the forms and making sure that they're all being entered. And the reason I say that is my spouse is a dentist and I've turned it in four times and it's never there. And I think that, you know, we maybe need to take a look at that. All right, just uh, a couple of comments. <clears throat> Brad? Thank you. With respect to, uh, to gate one, actually, I, I kind of did the one at gate five. I had a number of residents send me emails saying that, that how irritated they were having to wait to make that right turn. And so I went out there and just made a point of driving it a lot. And sure as heck, quite irritating. And so we had uh, called the city uh, engineering and, and told them what we wanted to do, and they gave the approval, and we went ahead and, and restriped that. The, uh, it's really just paint. The, the lanes are all there. You're just really reducing the straight through lanes. And so I think, though I haven't gotten an email from anybody yet, uh, I think it's probably well worth looking at uh, for gate, gate one uh, as well. I think it's a good idea. On the... Uh, on the laundries, and I gotta hate to say it, just so unpopular, but laundry rooms are a little bit like bus service. You know, we got a lot of empty buses driving around the community, and guess what? We have a lot of laundries that don't get used very much, and the numbers don't lie. We know exactly how much every machine is used every day. We're very good data on that. Um, you know, my wife, she would like us to have two washing machines at my house because she is sick and tired of spending half the day doing laundry with one washing machine. But, you know, I've told her I, I think that's excessive, you know, but you just have to live with one. And so I think we have a lot of that here where, where you know, people want to come down and load up four machines at once, but then no one else uses the machines the rest of the day. And so, yeah, it's convenient maybe for one person, but we are way over machined in this, particularly in light of the fact that many, many residents have opted to construct their own laundry rooms in their manner and pay for the electricity, therefore. And so uh, going to the price, what is really fair for somebody to contribute to amenity they don't use at all? And how much? So right now it's maybe 50% shared and 50% user fee. That seems fair uh, to me. And then I think the last thing I would offer is, um, I believe, there may be others, but in my opinion, the laundry rooms are the most abused amenity. I might, I might lean towards room reservations too, because there's plenty of abuse there as well. But, but laundry rooms where you have kids and grandkids and caregivers and everybody in the world using those because they were so cheap. I think it's helped a lot uh, now that we've, we've raised it a little bit. It's, it's not a freebie anymore. Um, but still, we have a lot of people bringing wet laundry either down from their manors where they've washed it in a sink or family members bringing in wet laundry from the outside and drying it in the free dryers. And so that is just another area of abuse that you might want to think about in the future. I know we've talked about all these things many, many times. We've had extensive committee meetings on this. It, it has not been something that the board did, you know, willy-nilly. Uh, I wouldn't say it was an ex as extensive a debate as, say, pickleball, but an eight-year debate, but it might have been a two- or three-year debate, uh, a lot of discussion and thought. So we, uh, what I have found out about this particular laundry is the usage is pretty low, but the machine had a particular angle to it that residents liked. 
and, and it's an unusual machine, and so I'm going to try to replace that type of machine. So it, it has an angle so people with maybe a bad back who don't want to bend over or something can get things in and out very e much easier than a top or a front loader. So we're going to try to get that back in there for those folks who, who like that type of machine. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> a couple of comments. First of all, John, thank you very much for your... Uh, uh, eulogy, if you will, of uh, Tony. He was a member of our board, and many of us served with him, and uh, he certainly was an advocate for both the billiards and the dog park, and we remember many of his uh, uh, talks about that when he would come to the board. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Jack, <clears throat> the, there is a requirement, and it you can have one more decal than you have bedrooms in the original plan. So if it's a one bedroom, you can have two. If you have a two bedroom, you can have three. So it's one more decal than you have bedrooms in the original plan. So if you've added a third bedroom, third bedroom by enclosing an atrium or something, doesn't count. You're still, uh, the three is the maximum that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, Brad, do you have anything to add to Jeannie's about the Verizon Tower? Have you talked to them at all? Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of discussions with, with multiple uh, carriers. And I think actually Verizon was the one that had the proposal several years ago to put something on top of, of this building, which was, I think a little excessive. I think everybody freaked out. It was like a tower on top of the community center. And so I think the idea of going with maybe some smaller, less intrusive uh, repeaters and, and other devices probably makes sense. And we're more than happy uh, to work with them. And, and we're in contact with them fairly regularly. They're always looking for sites. All these companies are. Of course. Um, so, uh, and Verizon probably uh, it's debatable, but probably has about the worst service in the village, if I had to guess. So I think AT&T seems to be uh, a little better, and I haven't used Sprint, so I don't know. But I use Sprint. works fine. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, so yes, we're, we're uh, well aware of the Verizon challenges and are, and are more than willing to work with them. I think something on this building would, is a great location. It just can't be 50 feet high. Right. Yeah. Well, these smaller boosters might be a good way to go. Yes. So. And they can put them on, <coughs> on street lights and different things that are uh, very unobtrusive. Okay. Um, also, uh, Linda, you mentioned the California rebate for solar. Uh, Steve, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but as a private community, we do not, or we're not eligible for the California rebate. Is that not correct? Um, the... Whatever rebates we would have been entitled to, if any, would have been collected by JCR, JCI through the purchase contracts at the time and would have been passed on to us. I was not a member of the board at the time, but I do remember seeing the uh, original RFPs for both the equipment and the labor, and they were all shown to the board, and JCI made recommendations for both what to purchase and who to use for install. Thank you. And to Dick's comment for apparently problem with the broadcasting, it wasn't up there, but I think it was on uh, the regular TV. But I will mention again that we have a call for applicants who would like to serve a four-month interim term. Uh, Director Leonard has some outside business opportunities that are... Uh, uh, he needs his attention, and so he is going to be leaving us. So if you're interested in applying for the interim term, please see Catherine Lassiter upstairs in the general manager's office for an application. And we will be making that appointment at our April meeting. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we now have uh, the update from VMS and Director Anthony Libatori. Good morning, board. It's my pleasure to be here. 
And before we start, I'd like to give kudos to the board for their constant attendance at our VMS meetings. You know, when I started two years ago, I belonged to a few clubs here, and I was always challenged by some of the members that we VMS had secret meetings. Of course, it's not true, but you attending our meetings gives uh, tells that that's not true, and you are privy to what we're discussing. So again, kudos to this board that far outpaces any of the other boards. Thank you for that. Now, <clears throat> at our last meeting, uh, Director Mary Stone showed me a, um, a paper that we had, that she had developed be before the transition. And so I'm going to use that. I usually use the, the strategic plan, but Lori's gone now. So I want to use this to refresh where we're at. Uh, property services, for example completely overhauled, uh, not only visually, but there's so much going on behind the scenes. And this lady, Chris Bars, is absolutely amazing. And uh, so you can see physically the changes that have gone on here in the lobby and then thing, uh, out there, the uh, other room where people wait to get there. Uh, and the VSS staff can give, this staff with Chris leading it can give us numbers as they relate to property services and residents. She's on top of everything. And if you like detail, she's an amazing person. Just blow your mind. And it's not secret. <laughs> you can get copies of this stuff. And uh, now, something I have just gotten involved in, the garden centers. I just got a, a lot in the garden center, too. And uh, it no longer looks like a, a homeless encampment. It is now looking organized. It's looking neat. It's not, and it's a combination of staff who's taken the lead, setting out parameters for us as uh, residents that we should follow out of respect for each other. And although uh, VMS has set the tone and leads the impetus, residents are spending thousands of their own money to meet these standards. And set out by staff. And personally, I have made, from my little lot over there, I've met two neighbors that now we have formed some type of a shared health thing. When they go on vacation, I'll look out for their stuff and they'll look out for me. So it's, it's a communal experience at all and it's a good experience. And if you take, I don't know about Garden Center One, but I've been involved in two and it's really amazing what staff has taken the foresight and the lead in doing. And we have been using a company out of Seattle, out of our need to know numbers in, in terms of labor, non-bargaining and bargaining employees that are here at VMS. This company is an amazing company. They specialize in keeping track of labor costs. They have an amazing database that not only covers the United States, but even, I believe even in Europe. And they can answer any kind of a query that any board member or board would like. Uh, so we're watching your money. The checkbook is being watched. Clubhouse managers. Clubhouse managers now, thanks to Brett, have been empowered to be managers. And no more this old weary phrase of that's not my job. Their clubhouse is their job, whether it's electric, whatever it is, whatever has to be done, they've been given the power to deal with it. So that's another uh, kudo uh, for Brad. These, these, uh, and you know, some of our people have been around a long time and it may take them uh, a little bit to get up to speed, but they have been given uh, the power to be true managers. Uh, and VMS has, uh, Reimagine training in uh, safe work practices and in gathering and application of uh, data. We're, we're, I mean, we have so much data, I, I don't know what we do with it at all. 
and as it pertains to various departments. And don't forget management level candidates being considered for employment will learn the VMS way of doing things. In my work life, I don't like to call it a career because I don't think it's a career. I don't like that word. Anyway, I have worked for five different corporations and each company had developed its protocol, its own particular protocol to its business. And even language, in some cases, dealing with issues. Now, I'd like to divert here. Issues is a word I learned from my granddaughter. She told me to stop using the word problem. She used the word issue, so I've done it. And for us to have, who here who have been through the transition know what a daunting endeavor that was. And we made it. And now we are poised to take, the board is take United into the future. And finally, once again, VMS is very impressed by the support that the, this board has given us in every meeting. And I can't, I want to repeat that as often as I can. We really do appreciate it. There's no secrets. And you can get in-depth knowledge of department heads and what they're doing. And uh, again, you know, this idea that we were having secret meetings is, is a kind of a belies that snark. It has been my pleasure to give this report to you, and on behalf of myself, Mary Stone, and Dick Rader. And you may remember I like to use the update, <coughs> updated strategic plan when giving my report to you because it's a document that we all can share. And uh, Lori Moss is gone now, and uh, we'll have to decide. Uh, that that's my particular approach, so we have something in common. And uh, so we'll, we'll, I don't know if we're going to go on with the idea of a strategic plan or we come up with some other something that we can all share when we give a report to you. As a VMS representative, and since so many of you attend our monthly meeting, the board may want to... Since you, there's, I can't report anything that you haven't seen at the board meeting. So maybe you want to give us some more direction or keep it the way it is. We are your representative, Dick Rader, Mary Stone, and myself. We're open to listen to you. And <clears throat> I hate to be redundant, but our last meeting, you remember the outstanding report, the, the VMS meeting, I'm sorry, given to us by Chuck Collins. It was detailed. In retrospect, where did Brad find all these people? Think about the transition that we've had in the last three years. It's just absolutely amazing. And it's, it's what he's done, you know. So kudos to Brad. Our new human resource person, Carrie Weldon, another new hire, uh, is going to talk to us at the VMS about her vision for her department. Then, uh, at some time, uh, we're going to have Chris Spar come in, an amazing lady who's got her hand on, as far as I'm concerned, a bowl of M&Ms, you know, trying to get all that organized. Amazing person. And uh, also, we're going to hopefully we we'll get this here from uh, one of our monthly meetings, Ernesto, another amazing guy who's got, uh, I mean, his hands full, as far as I'm concerned. And, of course, with their line of work, we may juggle the presentations, but we do uh, produce, as you know, an agenda to let you know when people will give, when these department heads will be uh, giving us a report. And I'm, I'm very proud to have been associated with VMS and the work they have done. I mean, just think about it yourselves, the transition that's happened in the last three years. It's absolutely amazing. And it's all... Uh, due to support from the corporations. And that's the extent of my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> I might make a comment uh, to part of your report on the garden centers because uh, a few years ago, there was a waiting list of over 400 people waiting for a garden plot. That waiting list is now zero. And oh. there are garden plots available. So I'm encouraging all of our members who in the past felt it was a lost cause, apply for a garden plot. Madam Chair, I waited just four months for mine. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
And now we will go over to Mr. Hudson for our CEO report. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, honorable members of the board, uh, members of the United Community. It's always uh, fun to share some of the things that are going on. I'm going I'm to jump on Tony's back here on the garden centers. Um, it has been a huge turnaround. There's been a lot of work done. Much work remains uh, still. But we do have, as of yesterday, 50 garden plots available. So if you were worried about getting on that four or five year waiting list, you don't have to. Call today, get one of those last 15. Now more will come up, of course, um, but uh, it's, it's been a long time since someone could call and, and, and get uh, a garden plot. And, and much of that, quite frankly, uh, I hate to beat this up too much, but we had a lot of people that had way too many plots. You know, and residents with 15, 20 plots. I mean, that's, that's just too many. And so we started enforcing the rules, we changed the rules, and, and now everybody who wants one should be able to have a plot. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm happy with that work, and I know many of the members here who've served on the CAC over the years, it's been a, an ongoing source of issue. Hey, I had a great idea. I probably should have asked Maggie first. I think I overstepped my authority here. But uh, a resident came in with a great idea uh, about we had to take down a large sycamore tree down by the creek that was, uh, a lot of people were distressed, but it was quite ill and you know, termites and damage and all kinds of things. So we took that out and she said, you know, we ought to replant a nice sized sycamore tree there on Arbor Day and have maybe a little Arbor Day event. And so... I thought it was such a great idea. I, I sent it to Brian, and, and Brian uh, had a chat with Bruce Hartley, our landscape guy, and boy, they're, they're running with it. So uh, I think we're going to have an Arbor Day event. We're going to plant a big old sycam sycamore tree down by uh, the creek to replace the one that was there. So I, I hope everybody's okay with that. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Um, it kind of got out of hand real quick, you know, just kind of sent it out and pretty soon, you know, Brian's putting up flyers and, you know, got it going. But anyway, I think it'll be great. Um, I did want to talk about uh, uh, community manager position, Lori Moss. I know a lot of people uh, knew Lori and worked with her and were quite fond of her, as obviously many of us were. Um, we had interviews last week. I asked uh, a member from each of the four boards to participate along with Carrie Weldon, our HR director, and they pretty much came back unanimously with a candidate uh, that I think is going to be uh, spectacular. And I, actually, I, I am pretty familiar with this. I was actually familiar with a number of the candidates. It's a small world. Um, but uh, she is uh, a, a analytical, strategic mind uh, with with a um, focus on productivity and accomplishment. Um, and I think she's gonna be outstanding. We still have to do a little background work on here, on her. Um, we do extensive background investigations on anyone who wants to work here, uh, given the nature of the duties we do and our close contact with residents and their homes. So once we complete that process, uh, I will be making an announcement uh, to the community. And we are changing the title was really kind of misnamed as community manager. In the industry, that kind of means something a little bit different. And so the new title will be assistant general manager. So that's a little more consistent. So Anthony mentioned Chuck's uh, presentation last week, and it really it was quite spectacular, the volume of initiatives that are, that are being uh, brought forth to the community uh, is staggering, and I wanted to to just share a couple of them, if, if you're okay with that, Madam President. Um, certainly, I think probably the, the best one, for me, I, I like this kind of gadgetry, but is the tech, uh, or the transit scheduling. And so, right now, you call a day ahead for plan a ride, and we make a sheet out, and we hand it to the driver when they leave in the morning, and that's their route. There's no deviation. If the next door neighbor to one of those folks calls up, uh, unless we can reach them on their phone or something, that's picked up by somebody else. Even if they're going at the same place at the same time. It's, it's really quite nutty. And so this is kind of an, a, a Uber-like 
sort of program. It's not really Uber, but it's similar. It's actually much more sophisticated than Uber. And so they have sort of an iPad manual on the dash there. They don't know where they're going when they get in. We'll mash the button on the computer and it'll tell them where to go. And as new calls come in, it reroutes them to pick them up along the way. This is all for demand response, not, trans not fixed route transit. So your planner ride. And so, I mean, you're talking about probably, <laughs> probably a 50 to 70% increase in efficiency here and be able to pick these folks up. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Now, it has the capability, but we're not unleashing this yet for you just to, on your smartphone, just like you do with Uber, request a ride, and they'll tell you, yeah, we can be there in 15 minutes or an hour or 30 minutes, whenever it is, based on the, the routing that we have. And then that is automatically goes right to the to iPads on the driver's dash, and he, he just follows the, 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 the route that's given to him. And so it's an incredibly efficient, sophisticated tool. It took a long time to find this. We tried three or four as demos that were just stinkers, and then we finally <laughs> found this one that we really like. So I, I apologize it took so, so long. There are a lot of these products out there, and, and some of them are better than, than others. So we, we, we picked the right one. We're very excited about that. The other thing we just implemented, and it's been a, an ongoing source of concern for the boards for, I've got studies going back 10 years where the board was concerned about fleet management and when do you buy new and you know fuel efficiency and, and how our uh, staff hours build and all that sort of thing. So we just implemented a, a really total fleet management system called TMT and uh, it, it does all that stuff. All the cost allocations, the timesheets, the, the service, uh, requirements, everything monitors, all develops reports, tell you when to get rid of a car or truck, um, all those sorts of things. And it's really a spectacular uh, a piece of innovation that I'm proud of. We continue to implement the HRIS, which is really, I wouldn't say it's on the same scale as AX, but it's probably not far below that in terms of, you know, complexity and an organizational challenge and implementing um, eliminating a lot of the manual sort of timekeeping and things that are very, uh, because you know, it's great for, for a guy painting a manor to, to do a paper time card out there, but then somebody has to pick that up and then somebody has to enter that in the system and then, you know, it keeps going. It's very inefficient. And so uh, the HRIS system is quite spectacular. Would you like to define HRIS Excuse me. for our viewers? Human Resources Information System. Thank you. I'm sorry. Us nerdy types, you know, we just go on and on. I'm not as bad as Chuck, though. Um, and then probably the, the big enchilada, and it's what Andre's been waiting for and what I've been waiting for, and, and we finally got this thing to work. Our original plan uh, was to basically eliminate Stellar, which is kind of our CRM. It does all kinds of things. It's a, it's a, it's a monster. And... As we looked at that right now, the cost of replacing that is just astronomical. And so in lieu of that, we built a pretty sophisticated data bridge and we've been able to attach things to it uh, that make it appear that we've gotten rid of it and make it work a lot better. And, and, and so one of the big things that we're test, testing right now is, and, and we've been testing it for a while, is our mobile work order entry. Same thing with the, with the buses. You know, a guy comes in beginning of the day. Okay, here's your, here's your plumbing sheets for the day. And, and uh, if something comes in and it's right on his route and it's small and it's right next door, we really don't have any way to get a hold of those folks. And we really don't have any way to figure out how much time it's taken to do things. We have some guys that can do five toilets a day and others that probably do two. Uh, I, I doubt there's that much difference in complexity between those, those work orders, and so we need to, to figure that out. And so this is real time, real data, you know, supervisors, you know, pinging work orders electronically to, to uh, uh, plumbers and electricians and cabinet makers in the field, real time and have real data on exactly how long it's taken them to do these tasks. We know how long it should take. But sometimes with a paper chase, it's hard to, hard to track that down. So we're talking about a major, major increase in, in accountability, uh, work order scheduling, uh, resident tracking, uh, all those sorts of things. And then automatic responses to residents. Your work order has been completed. 
please contact us if you're not satisfied with, with the work. Very simple. Just like you get, I, mean, I don't know if you've made a dental appointment lately or a doctor's appointment, they harass you unmercilessly if you give them your email address or, or cell phone. Uh, are you sure you're coming? You said you were coming yesterday. Are you still coming? Are they just, you know, and that's the kind of thing we need to do. We're going to be there. We're there in 10 minutes. You know, here we are. And so that, that's going to allow us to have so much better data. And then this is a big one, too. The resident portal is, is it's not there, but it's really close, which will allow you to pay bills uh, with your credit card, you know, make room reservations, uh, do any number of things, buy tickets to the Performing Arts Center uh, through the resident portal online. Probably one of, the, one of the policy questions for the boards is, do we take things like Granicus, which is now sort of out in the public domain, and really tuck it behind the resident portal? Is that really for the world, or is it just for our residents? I mean, these meetings are members only. So my thinking is we probably tuck it, but we need to have that uh, for our residents only. So we can talk about that. And then, uh, and I got it, this is, I don't know if this is, uh, an advancement or not, but I think it really is. I can argue it. This is what used to be called the the analog deletion program, which we've now retitled to the bandwidth improvement program. Isn't that better? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little marketing here. And so uh, you all know the story, but I'll share it one more time because it's really hitting the fan right now. Um, when you most cable companies stopped broadcasting in analog 10 years ago. And so because you know, of, of you know, the kind of community, the age of our residents, a lot, we decided to go ahead and keep doing it longer. Well, analog uses a lot of bandwidth. If you think of it like a pipe, um, our pipe is filled up with a lot of low tech, uh, high bandwidth transmissions, analog. And so if you want to have really fast internet, and you want to have a much better cable system, you have to get rid of the analog broadcast. And so there are a number of things that happen when you do that. First of all is your analog TV won't get very much uh, unless you have a box. So if you have an analog TV plugged right into the, to the wall, you are not going to get very much in the future. You might get the jewelry channel and home shopping network. Um, because they pay us. Um, but other than that, um, it's going to be very, very difficult. And so we're more than happy to rent you a box for, I don't know, seven or eight bucks a month. Um, but I don't want to do that. It's a bad investment for you. You can buy a really nice digital TV for probably 100, 150 bucks down at Costco or Target or Walmart or any of those places. They're very inexpensive. And so if you want to know, well, do I have a do I have a analog TV? Well, if it's more than about two inches thick, there's a real good chance, actually an inch now, they've gotten so thin, it's a pretty good chance it's analog. If you can't pick it up and move it across the room yourself, it's definitely an analog TV. And so uh, I recommend you don't get the box. Yeah, we make a little money on it, or you know, it's not really making money, but it, it's a part of the system. Um, but for an investment for a resident, I would highly recommend just go buy a digital TV and plug it into the wall. You'll get a bunch of channels, a really nice guide, um, and it'll be far superior to what you're getting with the current analog. Now, we deleted a few channels uh, in January. We kind of st started off light. We didn't want to go too heavy initially, and so the, I, we, I don't think I got a single call. But who heard of freeform TV? I mean, yeah, no one got too excited about that. Well, this month, it gets, the cut is a little bit deeper. And so the channels that will be deleted from your analog selection will be WGN, History Channel, Travel, BBC, American Movie Classics, Arts and Entertainment, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic. That's some pretty meaty stuff. And so if you have an analog TV, over the course of the year, we're, we're just taking a few down as we go along, um, you'll notice that your options are dwindling. And so um, I'm more than happy uh, to have someone come by and pick up that old analog TV. I beg you, please don't pick it up or have your neighbor pick it up or one of our gardeners and set it by the trash can. That's another problem we have. <laughs> That's a different, different time. But yeah, we'll come, we'll come get it. Just give us a call. 
um, and get yourself a nice digital TV. And then the other thing this allows is for us to bring in some of the more modern uh, cable TV products that we just can't support right now because we don't have enough bandwidth. And that's things like the whole home DVR to allow really residents to take control of their own TV viewing. You can record six shows at a time. You can bring in shows, you know, over the internet, you know, from, you know, Hulu and Amazon Prime and some of those things that a lot of people are doing now. I don't really do it myself, but I know a lot of people do. Um, and so there you have it. I did want to let people know the gates uh, are on their way. We're in heavy, heavy design. Um, we could have probably moved this faster by designing one, building one, designing one, building one, but it would have cost us a ton of money. And so we're designing them all. There's eight gates that we're doing with the gate arms and the technology. And we're going to bid them all at once to one contractor. And then they'll probably end up doing two at a time, well-spaced and getting through it. But that's the most cost-effective way to bid this out. The, the pack median inside uh, gate three, you probably noticed the plum trees are gone. Did anybody notice that? Yeah, yeah, they're gone. Well, plum, ornamental plum trees are subject to just about every disease a tree can get. From various molds and fungus, I think they even uh, are susceptible to uh, glassy wing sharpshooter, I mean, you name it, they get it. Uh, not, uh, uh, black knot, I think, is a disease they get. They just get everything. And so those were highly diseased. We removed them. And that's going to be replanted with a sort of drought tolerant, though attractive, sort of California scape that I think everybody's really, really going to enjoy. So we're, we're happy to bring that to you. We did finish the, uh, the History Center roof and HVAC are just about finished. I don't think we disrupted the library too much, maybe a little bit. I got a couple emails. Um, and then I've had a lot about the pools. Um, pool four was a fairly modest repair. And then when we pulled, there was a replastering job and we pulled the plaster off, there were significant structural uh, problems underneath the plaster. And so um, what appeared just to be cracks in the pool when you actually got in there was much more significant. And so we had to do uh, a lot of epoxy work and other work to make that right. I'm told within the week, pool four, it is our sort of our therapeutic pool. It has easier access, it has higher temperatures, a lot of things going on. We're using, I think, pool one for therapeutic right now. And so I'm hoping within a week that'll be done. But, and now we're going to pool five, and we're pretty sure that the same things that ha we had at four, we're going to have at five. And so we'll know shortly once we start removing that plaster. And I know it's on your agenda and you'll talk about it, but um, we're very, very happy uh, for you to consider the handyman program, uh, of course. And so that would, uh, oh, and I, I must say this, because Ernesto sent me an email this morning. Um, he says the waistline, the priority to paint, everything is way ahead of schedule. That they got out of the gate quickly and they're, they're moving along. And he particularly commented, or actually Bruce commented on the on the concrete that they're, they're doing so much uh, that probably mid-year they may want to come back and talk to you about do you, you know, do you want us to move on somewhere else or do you want to do more? And so that's a good thing because it's been an area I think that's lagged for many, many years. And so that's exciting. And then, of course, we want to talk to, uh, you know, lighting is probably for residents one of the biggest issues in not only United in third two, but I think maybe more in United. Um, and so things like maybe putting the trees around the street lights on an annual trimming schedule and, and things like that. And, and then working with our new energy consultant to develop better ways to light up some of these uh, kind of remote dark cul-de-sacs. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to look at that. And I do hear from so many residents. And I talked to Dan Yost about trip and falls and things. And, and uh, I just think we should elevate that discussion. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> uh, we will move to item number 11, the consent calendar. I remind everybody the consent calendar. These are items that have been brought forward to the board from our committees. They have been discussed and uh, vetted at committees, and these are endorsements that come for final board approval. Um, <clears throat> we have two under architectural control, 
We have none under landscape this time, and we have one under the Finance Committee recommendation. <clears throat> Is there any uh, uh, thing on the consent calendar that a board member would like to pull? And the election schedule. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. D, approving the election schedule. Hard to believe, but we are actually into election season again. So uh, we would uh, uh, approve the dates for the 2018 election. Can I have a motion so to move. approve? Second. Okay. Let's see there. Any objections? So without objection, the uh, <coughs> consent calendar is approved. And now we go to number 12, which is unfinished business. 12A is a motion to approve resolution endorsing the handyman program and setting policy. We talked about this quite a bit last month, but we didn't have a final <coughs> policy. We now have a final policy with the fact that it's going to be $200 a year and the service would be three calls per month of two hours each uh, maximum for people who are enrolled in the program. So that's why we need to not exactly start again, but it does need to go on 30-day notice, and we can't finally approve it because we didn't have the policy last month when we had first reading uh, until next month in April. So uh, do I have any... I, uh, first of all, I need a motion to approve resolution on the handyman. Shall I read it? Down? Yeah. Well, you, uh, no. Yes. Okay. Resolution 0118XX Handyman Services Program. Whereas the United Laguna Woods Mutual has a chargeable service policy for non emergency maintenance repairs for specific original and standard components within the mutual dwelling units. Whereas a new handyman services program has been designed to help residents with a wide range of repairs and provide other assistance around the home not covered by monthly assessments or chargeable services. And now, therefore, therefore be it resolved on April 10, 2018, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves the handyman services program as defined by the service agreement attached to provide limited maintenance services to alteration and non-standard components not currently covered by the mutual and resolve further participants will sign a service agreement and pay the $200 annual fee and resolve further participants will receive up to three service calls per month, not to exceed two hours per service call for items on the board approved description of services Resolve further that net revenue or net expense for the program will be reflected in the mutual operating fund. And resolve further the board recognizes that costs incurred by this program may exceed revenue generated during the initial implementation period. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Don, you want a second? Okay. <coughs> Any discussion on the handyman service? Yes, Steve. Do we have a limit to the number of people who are going to be enrolled in the service the first year? No, <clears throat> we don't. We don't know what it's going to be. This is kind of a pilot thing, and we're, we're hoping a lot of people will want to be part of it, but we do not have a minimum or a maximum at this time that uh, can take part in the program. Okay. So assuming it is um, put into effect at our April meeting, then people will be able to start signing up. And you sign up for a year depending on when you sign up. It's not the calendar year. So my recollection on this, because it's been a topic of investigation and discussion from some time, <clears throat> is that originally there was going to be a limitation as to the number of people who could sign up the first year because the cost of the program um, is exceptionally inexpensive. 
if someone signs up for this for $200 and they get 36 calls for the cost of the year, the cost of the call is $5.55. It's always been a concern to me. And if it's going to be unlimited, um, kind of like my conversations with Brad previously about can we get some electric cars and have some on-demand call service to shuttle people back and forth, the fear is that the program would be so successful that you're going to have so many people enrolled in it that there's not going to be any way that two employees will be able to service the program for everyone who's going to want it. And in my mind, that could implode into a situation where you have hundreds of people calling up to complain that they're calling in for service and they're not getting the service that they subscribe to. So um, I would like to see some collar put on this program for the first year as to the number of people who can subscribe to it. And I think what you're going to find is in the second year that you're going to uh, reduce the number of calls uh, that are provided. And you may have something like for $200 you get six calls a year. But beyond that, now you're going to have to pay some other charge. Because you know, with the burden rate and the cost of the employees, this could, this could get really expensive really fast. And people could get very upset. So that's kind of my concern without a collar as to the number of subscribers. Maggie? Uh, it's hard to believe. It, it looks, when you look at the list, you see what will be handled. It's hard to believe that everyone who signs up is going to do everything on the list and use that many hours. Now, the first few months should probably be pretty heavily used by the people who sign up. Then, of course, their manner won't need so much attention. You know, they will have fixed those things. So it isn't like the need to replace this electrical fixture and this and this and this is going to keep repeating. So that by the end of the year, their personal needs will have dwindled and somebody else may have signed up. So I kind of think that this should work out. I expect the first month or two, everybody will be real excited and try and get everything in because they've been waiting a couple of years for this. But I think it'll even out by the end of the year. Uh, <clears throat> Cash, do you ask to speak? Yeah. I think uh, we have to mention that this program is strictly for the United residents and not for the Th That's correct. Yes. Yes. Gary? It's also my understanding that after a year, we will be reviewing the program to see if it's cost effective or not. And at that point, we can make a decision as to whether we uh, go on with the program or, or uh, end the program. Right. It is a pilot program. And uh, looking at the, pilot, the program in Walnut Creek that we are basing ours on, we figure that the numbers are pretty accurate. We'll have to see how it goes in the village. And it is a trial program. And after six months or after a year, we will look at it again and say, we need more people, we need less people, it's working, it's not working, et cetera. But the point of a pilot program is to see uh, how our residents accept this. Any more comments? If not, I'll call for the vote. Question. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. Dick? Uh, well. Oh, I'm sorry, Andre. You didn't push your button. OK. Oh, sorry. Uh, I would think that uh, if it's so successful, you know, 6,323 uh, 6, uh, manners all request that, that would be su such a successful project, and potentially we can just roll into assessment. And so that's one direction we can go. If it's really successful, everybody wants it, then it is definitely something that we want to provide the residents this kind of service. So I'm not worried about uh, too successful. I'm, my concern is if it's not successful, then this probably can be canceled if uh, something like that happened. So that's my concern, and that's my comment on that. Any other comment from the board? Steve? So I'll just close with this. If we have two, if we have two men available to do the work, and if the average call is an hour, 
including travel time to and from. Given a full year of full-time employment for two employees, if you had 600 and people, 680 people sign up for this, they would each get six calls per year. That's the maximum that you could deliver at one hour per call. If you allow them 36 calls, as this is written, you, can't, uh, you cannot sustain this for more than 113 subscribers. That's the worst case scenario. Thank you, Steve. That's our, our numbers, man. <laughs> Maggie? Uh, this program identically is also used in Leisure World, Maryland. And you can look that up online and see the same program. Thank you. <clears throat> Andre? Uh, I believe uh, Director Lander has a very good uh, uh, comparison on that. Uh, I, it sounds like your assumption is we're going to fix at the two employees, two full-time employees. Uh, so if it's very successful, maybe we can change that. Maybe we can increase uh, staff and uh, uh, make it more uh, available to the residents. The idea is to uh, not assume uh, two people or uh, how many people, let's give it a try as a pilot program and see if there's a needs in the community. If the needs is really, uh, the demand is really high, then we know we found some needs that we can help our residents. And all other bets are off, um, number of employees, how many hours they work, uh, how many support staff we need, those are all adjustable parameters from the board's point of view. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Brad? Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. Um, this program comes at great personal sacrifice to me because the two guys who are going to be doing this are currently kind of the guys that fix everything around the village that has to be fixed right now. So, one of, you know, if one of you or one, I see something and boy, we dispatch these guys out and they, they're pretty handy, uh, Junior and Jose Luis, we, we, we pick these two guys because they are so customer service oriented and, and resident friendly, and we think they'll put a really good face on the program. But I uh, share uh, Director Leonard's concerns. I've, I've shared this before. I, I think the number of calls is too many. I, I would be more comfortable with something like 24. Um, I don't think calls will take an hour. Um, I just don't. I think most things will be quicker than that. And I think. We may be able to use our TMT software, our, our transit scheduling software, to make sure we route these folks in the most efficiently possible way. So that, that's one of the things I want to look at as well. But I do share that concern. I did want to respond. I think at Agenda Prep, uh, Director uh, Armanderas mentioned he was concerned about uh, vehicles and, and, and you know where do you get them and what happens if you, know, you decide not to go forward with the pilot or whatever. All, all the vehicles are are provided by GRF and they, they never bill the mutuals for a vehicle or any other equipment. You never pay for that. That's just something that they pay for. And um, if, if say, you wanted to move forward in a different direction down the road or not have the program, have a different kind of a program, we could repurpose uh, the vehicle. We have many, many vehicles, as you've probably seen, on the road that probably shouldn't be on the road. And I, the ones that are worthy, I've had painted. <clears throat> the ones that are on their last leg, they look like it. And so we, there's always room to, I think, upgrade the fleet. We, we keep vehicles probably a little longer than we should in certain cases and uh, expose ourselves to potential liability and also uh, uh, high maintenance costs. So new software will help with that too. Thank you. <clears throat> now, Dick. Yeah, Dick Rader, 270 D. Uh, I have a question and then a thought. <clears throat> the question is, you answered about the vehicles, but uh, who is bearing the cost for outfitting the vehicles and the tools that will be needed? Is that GRF? Yes. That's GRF. They, they put the bill for that, yes. Okay. And the other point is, if you have 1,000 people at $200, that's 200000 how many, um, uh, uh, what leeway do you have to add additional people within that $200,000 budget if you needed to? Yeah, I, I think we have the flexibility to do that. 
So you, uh, so do you think you could double it, triple it? I think that, that would be very optimistic for a first year. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking if we could get. 200. <laughs> you have I was thinking more like 500, but 200 is probably more realistic. I was just thinking about the money side. If you had 500, uh, you could easily cover probably the two guys that you got, and, and they would be very busy if folks didn't call 30 times, because uh, then that, that would swamp it. I think what the experience has been in other places is that initially there you have this kind of huge uh, demand for things that maybe just been let go for a while. They didn't change that light bulb or whatever, you know, that you, you know need things moved uh, out of the manor, whatever that might be, small repairs. But over time, the number of calls dwindles down to something more like 10. And so, uh, you know, they need to have, uh, many of these things are very common household chores that, that um, you know, a, a very old seniors can't do. You know, pull out, pull out the height of sofa because family's coming over, put a leaf in the table, get the luggage, you know, out of the, the very highest part of the closet. There's little things like that that are everyday chores that people have trouble with. They don't take an hour. You know, they take five or ten minutes. And so that's, I, I think that's really the important part of this. We'll always fix an outlet or, you know, change a bulb for you. That's no problem. But, but it's those daily chores in your manner that you just, you know, get a certain age, you just can't do that anymore. And, and that's what we want to help with. Thank you. You had a comment, Dick? No. You're okay. All right. <coughs> Janie? You know, I pushed my button also. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when we first started talking about this, I believe the comments were Walnut Creek, when they first started, they had two or three people only in their first month or so. So it took them a while to catch on. Any other comments? All right, I'll call for the vote. This is a vote. Uh, <clears throat> a motion made by Maggie and seconded by Don to move this ahead to our April uh, agenda for a vote then. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's unanimous, Cheryl. All right, second item under unfinished business is a motion to introduce a resolution establishing a policy for directors' access to corporate books and records. We brought this forward for first reading last month, and we did um, postpone it 30 days to comply with the civil code. However, our attorney has assured us this is an operating rule. It is, does not require the 30-day resident notification, correct? Correct. It's not an operating rule. It's a it's procedure. It's a procedure. Excuse me. Yes, let's get it <laughs> said right. So uh, that's why it's on your agenda for today. And uh, can I, would you read the uh, resolution, please, Maggie? Uh, resolution 0118XX, Director Access to Corporate Books, Records, and Documents. Mm -hmm. United Laguna Woods Mutual is a nonprofit mutual benefit corporation existing under and by virtue of the laws of the state of California, organized for the purpose of providing its members with housing on a non on a cooperative nonprofit basis, pursuant to the provisions set forth in its articles in incorporation and bylaws. Whereas United, through its volunteer board of directors, is responsible for management, maintenance, and administration of a residential stock cooperative common interest development under United's governing documents, which include, without limitations, the Articles of Incorporation, Bylaws, Occupancy Agreement, Operating Rules, and Board Resolutions, which grant United the authority to manage and govern the affairs and the properties within United, whereas pursuant to Corporations Code Section 833.4, every director shall have the absolute right at any reasonable time to inspect and copy all books, records, and documents of every kind, and to inspect the physical properties of the corporation of which such person is a director. 
whereas the Director's general right of inspection may be preempted by the right of privacy guaranteed under the California Constitution, or may be subordinate to statutes specifically protecting confidential, private, or privileged records, and California courts have also acknowledged a constitutional right to privacy held by members of HOAs in their voting decisions, whereas the director's duty of loyalty involves not only the duty to avoid conflicts of interest, but requires full disclosure, disclosure of any interests potentially adverse to United, and whereas United desires to adopt clear guidelines and procedures for director access to United records and director's handling of those records while protecting United from liability claims arising from the review, copying, and dissemination of corporate records. Now, therefore, be it resolved March 13, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts a policy governing directors' access to corporate books, records, and documents, and other go governing documents regarding access to United's records, and resolve further that the officers and agents of the corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move this resolution. Eric, were you seconding? No. Oh, Steve. I shall. Steve, okay. All right, I might mention that GRF adapted this policy last week at their meeting. All right, uh, any, you know, Gary, would you like to discuss? Yeah, and I would like to run this past legal counsel also, but um, I feel and I'm, I'm for this as long as the shareholders are also advised of what it's costing us when they're pulling these reports. Is that possible, Jeff? Can we release that kind of information? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Okay, <clears throat> let's say that someone, one of the directors requests a report and it costs us ten thousand dollars to provide that report. Can we let the shareholders know what the costs associated with these requests are? If a director is exercising their rights as a director to access United Records mm -hmm. and they're following the procedures that the board has adopted. Um, and they go through the process to obtain those reports, um, and it happens to cost the corporation money, that can't be um, disclosed in a way that could subject that director to uh, hostility or any type of retribution. It, the board can include as a report to its members information, and the information that it reports can be reported in a way where costs are incurred for certain operating expenses, but it can't be used to single somebody out as a punitive measure. Yeah, and I, I understand what you're saying, but I also read that law as a reasonable request, and also when you're looking at dollar-wise what it's costing the constituents, um, what is reasonable, and at what point do we let the people know what it's costing them? And I, I, it's a good question, and I think one of the many benefits of adopting this policy, which GRF um, did last week after obtaining our draft policy, GRF piggybacked on it and adopted it with some minor revisions, um, is that this policy gives the board the tools to process and evaluate requests by directors to access these records. And if the request is going to, in the board's opinion, obviously with the guidance of staff and legal counsel, um, unreasonably consume the board or staff or result in unreasonable expenses, then I think this policy helps manage that to a manageable level. I think it should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis to where if it becomes unmanageable or unreasonable, and the board feels the members should know, 
then with my help, we can disclose information and educate the members on what is before the board and what's challenging the board, but it, we just have to do it very carefully. Thank you. <clears throat> Maggie? Uh, yes, uh, looking at the director request for access, which is the very next page, on the first paragraph in the dark print under telephone number, I'd like to add in a word. On the second line, it says, dialogue between the staff and me. Add the and, please. That's all, just that correction. Staff. Okay. Any objections? We'll add that word. Andre, you were next. When there's a suspicion or of wrongdoing, um, I don't believe that sometimes the people that are managing this, these numbers are aware of that and also they are not following the best procedure to do it right. And as a result, it may cost some kind of uh, extra cost. That's the director's responsibility to look into that and say, you are doing this thing wrong. That's why it's costing money. Uh, for example, Brad has brought uh, up the issue about uh, concrete pavement uh, replacement uh, programs, very successful. However, it's been there for several years. So if a director can look into that, can provide, have that kind of information, we could have identified it a, a few years ago. And there are other issues like work requests. We are trying to find the information, why are the delays, why are the residents complain about they put in the request and they disappeared, it took them so many years to finish it. We know there are problems there. It is director's responsibility to look into that kind of information. And looking at this resolution, also in the same time, uh, one, two, three, four. The fourth, where is uh, agenda item number 12B, page eight of nine. Uh, the third one says, uh, clear to state every director shall have the absolute right and in a reasonable time to inspect and copy all books, records, and documents of every kind and to inspect the physical property of the cooperation of which such person is a director. Okay, so at the reasonable time, the only thing that respect is reasonable time. You cannot say, I want to see it now, 12 o'clock in the middle of night, as some of the uh, directors have mentioned that. No, you cannot. You have to during the reasonable time, during the working hour. So that's one limitation on that. And the fourth where uh, stated, uh, uh, in the middle of the paragraph, stated uh, protecting confidential, private, and the privileged record, and also the next line, privacy held by members. So if it's confidential information, then it's protected. Uh, we cannot ask for that. However, confidential information is that also can, uh, can board directed. We cannot even ask for confidential information. Something confidential information in the, uh, is hiding something or is, what is the reason? They cannot publish it they can request and examine it, should be able to do that. Private information depends on what kind of private information it is. The private information is, uh, so you, if this relate to, specifically relate to certain private residents, which has nothing to do with the uh, performance of the uh, uh, service, then that's not related. Uh, then that should be protected. Uh. But if the private information has something to do with the performance, then that, that's what the director's responsibility to look into that and say, why are these confidential information, private information, causing the performance of uh, our, uh, an increased assessment of our community? Those information, when we, you all lump into confidential private, that can block the director out of uh, looking into and due diligence trying to find out what's happening with our service. Or privileged record. I don't know what privileged record stands for at this point. Privileged record seems to be a very broad category. Say it's privileged. You don't have the right to look into that. And why is that? I, I, I'm kind of struggling with that, these three words there. 
uh, private privacy held by members of HOA in their voting decisions, which I totally agree. I have no problem with that. But these confidential, that's the uh, board of directors should have the right to look into confidential and the privileged records and determine whether there's any problem with the process or any wrongdoing. For example, a few years ago, we have a purchasing card abuse. If anybody declared that's confidential information, privileged information, private use of the car, then we cannot look into it. We will never find out the abuse of purchasing card. So those are the things that, uh, uh, that I'm, my concern is these words can be abused and prevent directors from looking into what's going on uh, with our service there. Uh, and I totally agree, a director's duty of loyalty involves not only the duty to av avoid the conflicts of interest, uh, but requires full disclosure of any interest potentially adverse to the United. I totally agree with, with that. If the director is abusing the uh, authority, this opportunity to look into the information and use this information for personal gain, this uh, director, if there's a proof on that, then this director is really guilty of uh, violating this resolution. That is my comment. And uh, I just don't feel comfortable with this uh, uh, access of corporate books. Uh, another example is that I've been asking uh, last time when we were asked, or, or, uh, voting on the uh, guarantor information, I was trying to get information about delinquency related to guarantor. It was denied, so we don't have that kind of information. And that information is not available. That information should be able to prove that uh, guarantor has nothing to do with delinquency. So there are situations that this information is just totally flat denied, and the directors cannot have the information to prove their case. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Jeff, would you like to explain? If I may, um, this resolution addresses the um, corporations code, which specifically um, regulates access to corporation records, not just by members, but by directors. And the words confidential, private, privilege, all are words that the courts have recognized as um, areas that directors can be regulated and limited from accessing records um, in very limited situations. We're not talking about um, areas that um, the board or staff can use to interfere or, or prevent a director from accessing records and exercising their rights to, for example, audit expenses. Um, I think to suggest otherwise, as Andre just mentioned, to prevent one of you fellow directors from um, doing your due diligence would be disingenuous, not just to the board, because this board would not allow that to happen if any director came before um, the body and, and, and brought information of concern about expenses um, and asked the board as a, as a whole to investigate, the board, I think, would be extremely willing and able to direct staff to investigate that to report back. That's not what this policy is about. This policy is about ensuring that directors do not expose themselves, the board, and the corporation and staff to unreasonable liability. For example, if a member um, who is suffering from a mental or physical condition or disability and needs to be accommodated um, in the way they live in the community, in the way they enjoy and use their manner um, or the facilities, um, and approaches staff and asks for a legally recognized accommodation, um, in order to be granted that accommodation, they have to share very sensitive medical information. I don't think any one of you directors should be able to access that information. Um, I think staff should access that, review it, analyze it, give a report to the board, and the board should be able to act on that. If there's reason to believe that the information provided is not credible, then I think at that point the board can get more involved in um, evaluating that information. But private confidential medical information is one of many types of areas that um, the board should be very careful about accessing. 
Now, if a majority of the board got together and said we all want as a body to access certain information, then I think that could be done uh, with my guidance and staff's guidance. But there's many other areas. For example, if a ballot measure is put out to the members and they're asked to vote on something and to sign their name to that ballot, it's not a secret ballot, it's just a written ballot and they're asked to vote on it. The law is very clear that directors do not get to see those ballots. They don't get to see who voted how on any particular ballot measure. Uh, that's a very specific published court decision. So even though the corporation's code does say that directors have an absolute right to inspect, the courts have interpreted that to mean based on reasonable restrictions and regulations, which this policy sets to um, strike a balance with. And again, I think that um, the members have voiced their opinion as to who should lead this community. I think the members should be confident that this board will not allow um, staff um, or any one board member interfere with another board member's right to exercise their um, ability to inspect records. Um, but it's up to this board to make sure that that um, inspection right does not expose the corporation or the board to unreasonable liability <coughs> risk or financial risk um, from the standpoint of consuming staff. There's a balance that has to be struck, and I think this resolution and its accompanying policy gives the board the tools necessary to um, regulate and, and control directors' access to records and to further facilitate and encourage the board to act together as a whole and bring issues of concern before the board and bring those issues that the board agrees to staff and instruct staff to look into these issues and report back to the board so we're not left with a situation where we have um, 11 directors instructing staff to go 11 different directions on the same issue um, and not allowing staff to do their job. Uh, Maggie, you were next. I have nothing. Uh, more. Okay. Uh, Cash? Uh, the recipient of this form is the board anyway. So the board finally decides whether it's going to be excess in money or it's not appropriate or if it's not uh, privately, you know, private information. Mm -hmm. So why are we discussing and spending time on an issue that is clearly states that this is the form in order to get people to access records submitted <coughs> by the applicant director to the president of the association board. And the board then said yes, nay. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Thank you. All right, I have Steve Parsons on my list and I don't no. think he's on our <laughs> board. Me. That would be <laughs> me. Manuel. Okay, <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, Steve and then Manny. Just going from my well, list. I'll, I'll, I'll yield I'll first to Maggie Parsons. so that Maggie can respond to okay. Cash's Daniel? remark. Maggie, you had a response for cash? Oh, wait, I have the final. Okay, so <clears throat> there are reasonable requests for information for the conduct of the board's business and, and the community's business, and there could be unreasonable. And the pur purpose of the policy is to ensure that reasonable requests are handled in a manner according to law. If someone thinks that their request is reasonable and it's determined not to be reasonable and that request is not granted, then any director can ratchet that up in uh, their application in a court of law as any member could. We've had situations in the recent past where we've had requests for information which were deemed to be unimportant to the conversation and subjects. And um, when individual directors, just because a director wants some information doesn't mean that they're entitled to it, especially when it comes from staff. There's a difference between the conduct of the operation of our corporation and the conduct of the management corporation VMS. One of the things that I think 
needs to be clearly spelled out for everyone is, if a director has a concern about the manner in which VMS is providing a service, that's ultimately a decision by the entire board whether or not to continue to use the management company in the fulfillment of those practices. Each one of us as directors does not have the right to go into VMS and say, I want to see how you're doing this. I want to see how you're doing this. I want to see why you're not doing it this way or that way. It's like having a contract with someone. You contract for them to provide you with a service. If you're dissatisfied with the service, you have a conversation with it, with them, and either they rectify the situation or they don't. Either you continue to use them for service or you don't. That doesn't give you the ability to go into their corporate records any time that you want because you want to know how they're doing something. So this sets forth director's requests for information that concerns our corporation. The other thing I'd like to mention real quick is we've had a number of situations recently where people have requested information and rather than going through the normal protocol, it's gotten out of the loop and it has cost dozens of hours of staff time and thousands of dollars to produce 130 page reports that were unnecessary and were predicated on misinformation that a director had. And had they just been given old reports, this last report would have never been used. So the reason this is before us is because we've had problems. And this is a way to tie them up and put them in a structured environment so we don't continue to have the same problems. Manuel. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I've been opposed with this uh, proposal from the beginning, primarily because um, my uh, wanting to be on the board was in order to make sure that all of our mutuals funds were being either properly used or wisely spent. And that's still my goal is to get the best results we can for the money for all of our residents. I have submitted on any number of occasions inquiries about financial information, either in financial statements, project logs, or interim financial statements. And I only raise these issues only because there were either inadequacies in the information or incorrect information or not complete uh, presentation of the facts. Steve refers to this 130-page report that was generated at a request that I started. And as far as I know, I went through the proper protocol. I submitted my inquiries to the board, and then it was taken from the board down to the staff, and then presented at a committee meeting. So the main reason I'm, gonna, I'm opposed to this proposal is because I just see it as another hurdle to avoid a director from exercising due diligence. And I know not all the directors uh, agree on that, the quality of that due diligence. I've, I've heard a director mention that you're not expected to exercise the same due diligence in your job as a director as you would out in the corporate world. When I heard that, I couldn't believe that. Because in my view, whether you're in the corporate world or acting as a director, you should be trying to do your due diligence responsibility at the highest level that you have available to you. So I won't pick any particular section out of this proposal. I'm just saying I'm opposed to it because it's just one more hurdle to prevent a director from getting information that he should be entitled to. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Maggie, you wanted to you made the motion, so you wanted to be last. Right. Um, <clears throat> I believe the second page of this form is self-explanatory if read carefully. Uh, this does not mean the board has to sanction every request. Mm -hmm. It simply says that you have these reasons for this request. Um, 
Every director's goal is the best for the corporation. There is not one person sitting here that does not want the best for the corporation, at least. I don't believe there's anyone that sits here. Also, one needs to think when evaluating our situation and our structure and our governmental way of doing things, we have to look at our class. We don't look at the outside profit-making corporations for our best practices. We look at our class, which is CIDs, HOAs, 55 and over. That is a limited class. If you don't like the way we're doing some things, yet we are doing what the others within our class are doing, maybe you're looking at the wrong comparison. This does not bind anyone's hands. This simply means you have to have a good reason and you have to be using the right procedures. As is explained, VMS is the one we should go to when we have questions. You may subpoena records, you may ask for these records, but if you want the service changed or increased, then United Board should say to VMS, all right, we are not getting the service under this issue that we would like, please bring us back a report on it and we can consider changing our service and either increasing our cost and our service or doing something like that. But we have to make the decision through VMS. We do not sit in any employee's chair. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Lastly, I think Jeff has a comment. I, I have a, mm -hmm. You've already spoken once, I'm sorry. Each one gets one. No. Maggie did because she made the motion. Steve seconded the motion. They get the last words. Uh, but Jeff was going to talk about data versus. Uh, oh, I just want to clarify um, based on the discussions I've just heard, there's a difference between a director's right to access existing corporate records <laughs> versus a director's um, request for staff to generate data, which does not fall within a director's right. So if a director um, requested staff to provide copies of uh, work orders or signed contracts, that falls within a director's right to access. Um, a director does not have a right, unless approved by a majority of the board, to request staff to generate uh, reports based on data. That, that's a directive to staff that must come from the board um, after being discussed and considered or after the board sets policy that gives certain individual directors authority or limited authority to instruct staff to perform certain functions. And a director asking staff to perform a function doesn't fall within this policy or within the rights of a director. All right, we have three uh, residents who want to speak. First, John Becker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I applaud the board for tackling this very difficult issue. You have rights that are important on both sides. But what troubles me is the procedure that was followed in bringing this resolution to the board. Several residents and I attended the meeting of the Governing Documents Committee at which this resolution was discussed. The meeting began at 2 o'clock. We waited patiently until about 4.30 when the item came up for discussion. After a very, very few minutes of discussion, the committee voted to endorse the resolution. As a matter of fact, I had my hand up when they passed that, when they passed that endorsement. <clears throat> Ordinarily, it's been in the procedure to, when a rule change is uh, being contemplated, uh, the board is usually provided with a copy of the existing rule. Back in July 8, 2014, by a vote of 9-0-0, the board adopted the following resolution, guidelines for director request of association records. This existing uh, rule was not presented to the committee. And uh, 
I don't see it in today's packet either. <clears throat> Um, I do believe that that the residents have a great concern in this issue. And I also believe that we had, we didn't get the kind of notice that we need, which is uh, required by the law. And Mr. Bowman has given us the opinion that this is not an operating rule. Well, this is the definition of operating rule that appears in the code. This is uh, Civil Code Section 4340. Operating rule means a regulation adopted by the board that applies generally to the management and operation of the common interest development or the conduct of the business and affairs of the association. This is a very broad definition, and I do believe that a guidelines for director requests of association records is indeed an operating rule. And uh, my last statement is I would uh, ask Mr. Beaumont to tell us if he has any authority for that interpretation. Thank you. Okay. All right, next is the Roberta Burke. <clears throat> Roberta Burke, 933B. I really think it's mandatory before you vote for this for you to stop and think and think back to the history that we have had in this community. I'm here almost 20 years. I think maybe you're here 20 years too. I'm not quite sure. And I've talked about this before and I know I'm going to run out of time. There was an attitude that we were all neighbors and boards tried their best to help individuals and to do what is good, generally speaking, always in mind what's the best for the community, but we are all the community. What has happened since in the last number of years is we suddenly have become the we's and the them's, whether it's a particular board issue that's, that's coming up, whether it's a community issue, whether it's a vote for directors, it now becomes this group against that group instead of just individuals who want to run. All these things have changed. With those changes have come more rules and more rules and more regulations. I think that if anyone were coming on a board and had to memorize all the things and all the ways in which a director has to behave now and all the regulations, even for people who live here, that we have to go through, you're either dead or off the board before you wind up knowing and understanding how to do something. Directors have been voted on by people in this community, generally speaking. Most of the times there have been choices, not always. Not everybody processes information or, or goes through decision making in the same way and some people need additional information that maybe nobody thinks is reasonable and reasonable is subjective. If that director wants to behave and make a decision that they think is good for this community, well, maybe they need something and nobody else thinks that. Or maybe this half of the board thinks one way and this half of the board thinks the other way. I think that when it comes to things like privacy, this issue that was read here, the first paragraph under C, I don't think we've ever expected anybody to disobey this. I don't think anybody has disobeyed it. But I have lived here. And one of the reasons we have VMSI and not PCM is because directors could not get information from PCM that they needed and that they wanted. And we decided to make it our own. And this is a, I lived here during a particular time in history when board directors, directors were, were deprived of information that they felt they needed and it became a major, major, major issue in this community. Maybe that's even what started this whole mo big movement of the we's and the they's and so forth. This is nothing but problems. This is nothing because everyone sees something differently. Everybody needs different information. If a report has to be made, a 130-page report, it's staff's responsibility to go to the president and say, hey, this guy came in and wants this and this and this. It's going to take me X amount of hours, and I think that you should make a decision on it. Don't lay it on everybody here and make Your time directors is up, for the Roberta. future. Make directors of the future have to 
worry about what they can ask for and what they can't ask for. I want my directors to Thank be able you. to get any information they can get to make the wisest decision. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Mary Stone. Thank you, Mary Stone, 356C. We have four separate corporations, and you are directors of only one. Uh, but you are members of two others, VMS and GRF. So as directors of United, you have access to United corporate documents. As directors, I mean, as members of the two others, you have access to specific information as members. So, you know, you, you have a limited access to information in the other corporations. Now, requesting information that has not been analyzed, <clears throat> compiled in a certain way, and you want your information in that format, that's not possible to request because that entails staff time and additional staff time in trying to massage the data. That's not appropriate to ask for as an individual. You must do that as part of a committee or, you know, ask your board for this if you have a specific reason for that kind of information. In the past, in this community, <coughs> PCM marked everything confidential. Anything that was debatable, uncomfortable, used to be marked confidential. I mean, it was just automatic, you know, confidential. And I have a lot of confidential information that is definitely not confidential. Anyways, um, when we ask for information, we have to be very, very certain about why we're asking for it. What is the reason? What is the benefit to the entire community of getting that information? And you just heard from our CEO this morning that VMS is working very, very hard to update the work order system that we have. Stellar was a great system. However, access to information through Stellar was damn near impossible. And now we are trying with our new technology to get the data so that it is more available to the directors. But we can't give you the past data that wasn't formatted and available because we didn't have that kind of technology. So I would beg your indulgence to look forward to the types of information that you need in the future so that we can make sure our systems cover that information. But don't ask for information that in the past was not gathered in formats that you, you would like today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. Can I respond? Uh, I have a response from, from Jeff on our, <coughs> excuse me, our member comments. <coughs> Thank you. If I may, just to respond to Mr. Beckett's um, discussion about the civil code and procedure, I just want everybody to be assured that the board is following procedure to the T under the civil code. The civil code section that Mr. Beckett referenced, 4340, defines generally under the Davis-Sterling Act just what a operating rule is. Um, that um, body of law um, goes on to state that for certain operating rules, only certain operating rules, the board has to follow a 30-day member comment period, um, which it does not have to do in this case because section 4355 of the Civil Code says specifically that 30-day comment period only applies to operating rules um, that address one or more of the following topics. Number one, use of the common area or an exclusive use common area. This policy doesn't address that. Number two, use of a separate interest, like your manner. Uh, this policy doesn't address that. Number three, member discipline. This policy doesn't address that. Number four, any standards for delinquent assessment payment plans. This policy doesn't address that. Number five, any procedures adopted by the Association for Resolution of Disputes. This policy doesn't address that. Number six, any policies uh, for reviewing or approving or disapproving um, proposed physical changes to manners. 
Uh, this policy doesn't address that either. And then lastly, procedures for elections. So because this policy doesn't fall within any of those seven categories, the 30-day comment period isn't required. And that's why GRF did not follow the 30-day um, comment period as well when they adopted this policy. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to call for the vote. Are a no? Uh, no? No? Oh, I'm sorry, Brad. You're not on the board. It is a policy matter for the board, but I, I can't help but take a little bit of this personally. And so I feel compelled to respond. Um, transparency is one of the four pillars that, that, that I outlined for the board. This is this, what we need to do. We need to be more customer service oriented, more efficient, be transparent with our residents, and then be accountable. When we screw things up or, or say the wrong thing, like I said something wrong earlier, I'm gonna correct later, but it happens. Um, and so, I have, in my career, really been a trailblazer in transparency. We did one of the first open data portals in Sacramento County where we put all RFPs, all contracts, all everything on there, a lot of raw data, and, and encouraged residents to look at it, mine it, come up with ideas and innovations that we can use, because here's it, here it is. Um, and I think we need to do the same, same thing here. Does that mean that, that we need to, to uh, spend considerable amounts of staff time generating uh, obscure reports? Probably not. Uh, probably not. But I'm committed. Any request that's reasonable that comes in, that if it's there, I'll just give it to you, usually the same day. I happens every day. People come in, do you have this? Do you have that? Yeah, if it's there, we just give it to you. Um, it gets a little bit different if, if the volume is high, then those have to be spread out over time because I can't, I can't dedicate staff resources for a week to do some really uh, huge project. But um, more or less, most of what people ask for, we can easily provide very quickly. And my hope in the future is that I would never have to provide a single document or piece of information to anyone ever again because it would be on our website for all to view. And so that is where I'd like to go. Um, now, obviously, first people's medical history or uh, litigation or personnel records, of course, we're not going to put those on the website. But that notwithstanding, most everything else. So that's my, my position on the matter. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I have a point to this? No, I'm no, sorry. No, no. No, that's you may not. We'd be glad to talk to you later. All right, I'm going to call for the vote. All of those, uh, the motion has been made by Maggie and uh, seconded by Steve that we introduce a resolution establishing a policy for directors, this is not members, directors' access to corporate books and records. All those in favor? <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five, six. All those opposed? <coughs> two. All right, the motion passes. <clears throat> Item number 13, which is new business. Uh, 13A is a resolution of our committee appointments. This is a, a monthly thing. We make different uh, assignments to committees uh, continually. And in this particular uh, instance, we have taken Director Leonard off committees because he is leaving us and we will be putting his replacement on when we have appointed that. So in the interim, this is the list of committees. Uh, would you read that, please? Okay, uh, resolution 0118 whatever. A United uh, Laguna Woods Mutual Committee appointments resolved January 9th. Wait a minute, that the following persons are hereby appointed to serve the corporation in the following capacities. Architectural Control and Standards Committee, Janie Durrell, Chair, Don Tibbetts, Co-Chair, Cash Akrakar, Pat English, Gary Morrison. Communication, I'm just reading the chairs, not the advisors, we're not, are we changing? The board members, no. Okay, okay. <coughs> Communications Committee, Maggie Blackwell, Chair, Juanita Skillman. Executive Members Hearing Committee, Juanita Skillman, Janie Durrell, Co-Chair, Co Cash Akrakar, 
Finance Committee Gary Morrison, Chair Manuel Armandaris, Pat English, Juanita Skillman, Governing Documents Review Committee, Juanita Skillman, Chair, Maggie Blackwell, Co-Chair, Gary Morrison. Laguna Woods Traffic Hearings, Cash Acricar, Rotating Chair, Landscape Committee, Maggie Blackwell, Chair, Manuel Armandaris, Janie Durrell, uh, Lands oh, Maintenance and Construction Committee, Don Tibbetts, Chair, Janie Durrell, Pat English, Gary Morrison, New Resident Orientation, according to the list. Resident Advisory Committee, Don Tibbetts, Chair, Cash Acricar, Co-Chair, Juanita Skillman. Uh, United Delegate to the Village Energy Committee, Juanita Skillman. And the Golden Rain Foundation Committee appointments. Um, business Planning, Gary Morrison, Juanita Skillman. Community Activities Committee, Janie Durrell, Juanita Skillman. Finance, Gary Morrison, Juanita Skillman. Landscape Committee, Man Manuel Armandaris, Maggie Blackwell. Maintenance and Construction, Don Tibbetts, Gary Morrison. Media and Communications Committee, Maggie Blackwell, Juanita Skillman. Mil Mobility and Vehicles Committee, Cash Acricar, Reza Bastani. Uh, PAC Task Force, Juanita Skillman, Don Tibbetts. Security and Community Access, Pat English, Don Tibbetts. Town Hall meetings as needed. I so move. I'll second. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded that we accept, and I, I, I reiterate, these are done almost every month. The executive committee has stepped in to replace some of the people who have been taken off committees, uh, and it will be brought up again next month, I'm sure. So it's been moved and seconded. <clears throat> moved by Maggie, seconded by Steve. Uh, discussion? Yes, Cash? Uh, I think we omitted this uh, Disaster Preparedness Committee. Disaster Preparedness Task Force, you are correct. Mm -hmm. And that's Cash. And is that for United or for Oh, no, as a matter of fact, it's GRF. GRF, okay. <clears throat> oh, yes, I see the other task force. Disaster preparedness. Okay, Cash Aquacar. Mm -hmm. and Gary, aren't you on that also? Yeah. Gary Morrison, okay. Thank you. <coughs> I so move the amendment. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Now the main motion. <coughs> and the main motion. <coughs> all those approve all those in favor? Any opposed? All right. The main motion passes as amended. All right, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 13B, discuss and consider a revision to the electrical usage reimbursement policy. Would you read that, please, Maggie? Okay. <coughs> excuse me. Well, yes. I have a correction there to the language. Could I use that now? Uh, 413B? Yeah. Uh, right there, uh, under the now therefore be resolved in that first paragraph where it says moisture intrusion events. It has a flat rate of $30, however, the staff and the whole study comes up with $32 as recommended. And okay. so I think that $30 should be $32. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, revised electricity usage reimbursement policy. Whereas the mutual has historically reimbursed members for electricity consumption related to the restoration of manors as a result of moisture intrusion, as well as for excess electricity consumed due to hot water supply line leaks, and whereas the practice of reimbursing members for electricity usage has not been formally recorded as an explicit united mutual policy. Now, therefore, be it resolved March 
13, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts the revised electricity usage reimbursement policy in accordance with resolution 010675, damage restoration policy, as follows. For moisture intrusion events when, where dry down of property is required, the mutual reimburse for electricity used at a flat rate of $32 for each room requiring the use of dry down equipment as verified by the moisture intrusion coordinator. For hot water leaks where excess electricity has been consumed, the mutual will reimburse for ele excess electricity consumption for a maximum period of three Southern California Edison billing periods as evidenced by detailed billing statements for each of the three periods involved. Additional electricity use beyond the th period of three billing cycles is the responsibility of the member and is not reimbursable by the mutual. All reimbursements will be charged to the contingency fund. Resolve further that Resolution 01-10-268, adopted on December 14, 2010, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Okay. Do I have a second? Don? Thank you. Any discussion? I might. Okay, well, <clears throat> let me do a board member first. Cash. Oh, great, please. Cut your hand up. <laughs> when when uh, a major leak happens and the bill is like 158 or higher, like some of these incidences, the person is already paying too much in other aspects. And, and on top of that, now we are telling him you will pay your $158 of your electric bill, and we'll only give you $32. To me, that sounds a little unfair uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, you're hitting somebody who's down on the floor, hitting him again. That's how I feel. Thank you. One of you. All right, Steve. Um, I think cash is under a misimpression. The analysis by staff was that it cost $158 in staff time to figure out how much to reimburse someone for the electricity. So the member is not paying $158. That's the cost to the mutual to figure out how much money to give the member back for the electricity that was used during the dry down service. If the dry down service was caused as a result of an alteration which the member is responsible for because it's their alteration or an alteration that they inherited when they became a member, they are not entitled to a reimbursement for the electricity because the damage was caused by their modification. This reimbursement only applies to members where there has been moisture intrusion which was not their fault, and that electricity was used on their <clears throat> bill. The construct that staff came up was that the average reimbursement amount for four days at $8 per day for a room would be about $32. That's what someone will be reimbursed. It does not go down to it was two days in one room for $8 a day for 16. Staff did not want to go to that level that, because they were already spending $158 to figure out they're going to give somebody 16 bucks. Yep. So this is the compromise. It just says, hey, you had a dry down service in a room, you get $32 whether it was two days or three days or four days. If it was two rooms, you're going to get 64. We've gone all around this in all the, uh, in, in all the committees, and it's uh, been well discussed and documented. Manuel. Uh, I have a question on the interpretation of this uh, um, policy here. Um, 
when I first read this, I interpreted it to mean that if you had two rooms that are involved in the drying out, and you presented a bill for, let's say, a month, then you'd get $64. But if for some reason you had increased electrical charges supposedly related to this for a second month, then you would get reimbursed for two months at $64 per month. Is that correct? Because if it's not, we ought to clarify that in this resolution. Thank you. I say that because it states three periods in here. Right. On the bills. Okay. okay. All right, Cash. My response to Steve is the bill is paid by the individual whose place got more moisture intrusion. Now he is paying the bill of say eighty five dollars or two hundred dollars or whatever, and we are reimbursing him for thirty two dollars per room. So he is getting penalized, even though it is not <coughs> Uh, maybe I don't read it right. No, Thank no, no. Thank you. Um, All right, Brad, would you like to? Yeah. Well, I, this is my uh, thing here because I got tired of having residents come in and say, it's taken me six months to get this reimbursement. And because they're, they're got to wait for all these bills and collect them, and it's a big time consuming thing. And you have a couple of staff people assigned to this, by the way. And then I go find out, well, how much is the reimbursement? Oh, it's $6.32. Or thirteen dollars, or eighteen dollars. I don't know if I've seen one over over fifty. There, there's some out there. I know when really bad cases happen. Ninety nine percent of residents are going to do better on this policy. There could be one horrendous case that where it's not better, but ninety nine percent of residents will do better. And I asked Ernesto to look into this, and we've got to end this this torture chamber we put residents through to really get most of the time twenty bucks or less. And so this eliminates all that. It's a flat amount. It's easy to administer. I can actually put those two people to some productive work. Um, you don't need to calculate bills. We can very accurately, assuming our, our vendors are accurate and they're reporting to us as to how many hours they were on, what the draw per machine is, and then we get the bills so we can see what rate the residents are playing, what tier they're in. And if they go to a higher tier, it's our assumption that we drove you to a higher tier through our activity, and so we give them the higher tier. But nonetheless, those reimbursements are all really pretty small. So I think for most residents will really like this. They'll like getting it within like two weeks, and they'll like that they get a little bit more than they would under the old way. So I, I think it's positive, and I can put people to work doing something that's meaningful. Okay. So that's the thing, and, and if it's unclear, uh, uh, Director uh, Armendariz, and we, we need to make that clear because it, this is a, a pretty good arrangement for residents, I believe. Cheryl, do we have How's any? It yes, Speakers we control. have Mary Stone. Mary Stone, 356C. Well, I've experienced both uh, the moisture intrusion events when a mainline stoppage backed up into my unit several times, and it was nice to, but I didn't have a noticeable effect on my electricity for just the dry down. I really didn't. So I never even asked for reimbursement. However, I did have a hot water leak, and my hot water tank is outside. And for several days, for several for at least two months, it was out there leaking, steaming up the landscape, and the landscapers didn't notice, and I certainly didn't notice. So I had a considerable high uh, bill, electric bill, for uh, watering the plants and the landscape in hot water for months, several hundred dollars. So I think the $32 for the moisture leak and just the dry down is, is appropriate. But when you look at those, those hot water leaks, particularly if the uh, units are outside, now you're looking at big costs for the electrical use unless you catch them early. Thank you, Mary. But this doesn't cover those leaks. This is moisture intrusion 
Well, you in said, units. you say hot water leaks where excess electricity, and you're talking there about just bringing in three billing periods, right. and that's what we did. I, I actually brought in a year's worth. Madam Chair, I was on the phone last night, about 8 o'clock, uh, with a resident who's about six months into one of these things, and in his, his manner, they actually was right before Christmas. They had to move the family Christmas. It was a horrible story. I felt so bad hearing it. And they had to remove all of the roof in the living room, and it was kind of a high-pitched thing. And it took quite a long time to get that fixed. So while the dry-down cost, we could calculate that out pretty accurately, but his bill year over year because of the heating cost was, you know, you know, a hundred bucks or so, and we don't even pay for that now. But in these special circumstances like that, I'll review those personally and approve them and say, yeah, this this guy's due a little extra money um, because he had six weeks during December and January of heating a manor with no roof in the living room. And so we can always accommodate those kind of special needs that come up, and they do come up. They do come up, and, and we have to be flexible enough to be able to handle that. And it's called a variance, yeah. and we have appeals for any of these um, <clears throat> uh, reimbursement charges. So uh, we, we can't go a lot with the what ifs. <clears throat> All right, do I have any other? Yes, Andre? Oh, I'm sorry, Maxie. <laughs> sorry. Maxine McIntosh, 68C. Just a point of clarification in the moisture intrusion uh, paragraph under now therefore here resolved. Um, when you say a flat rate, uh, does that, is that technical enough? Does that mean once only regardless or does that mean a flat rate um, per day or, or per week? I don't know. It's per event. It would be per event. Okay, everybody can understand that who reads it. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> Andre. Uh, thanks for the uh, detailed information that our CEO provided us. Uh, that's very useful information, uh, helping us understand that there are extreme situations and they are most normal situations and the average is under $20. Uh, however, what I'm thinking is if we, I'm sure that looks like uh, the VMS has all the data available for, uh, to justify those information. But if we have those information, have those data and uh, summarize it and look at the uh, uh, statistics and that will better, uh, you know, convince the, uh, uh, residents that we are doing our best and will cover most of the situation. So I would like to request, is it possible to provide uh, uh, that statistics? I understand this is a formatted information, so if it's not possible, if it takes staff time, I'm willing to take the data, raw data, and come up with some number and help uh, verify whether that information is, uh, uh, you know, advantage to the residents or not. That's my request. Juanita? That's, that's not in order. There was a staff report. There's, yes. There's the a, staff researched this. Mm -hmm. They came up with a recommendation. All right. I'd like to call for the vote. Can we share that information? <clears throat> we do not share the raw data. You do not have the ability to, or the right, to take raw data and make your own reports. You are ex we give you access to any reports that have been done. Have a right to request uh, raw data anymore? Uh, you're on order. Uh, All right, um, I'm calling for the vote. All those in favor of 13B, uh, <clears throat> a revision to the electrical usage reimbursement policy, <clears throat> please signify by raising your hand. Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Cash. All those opposed? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you in favor? Okay. All right. So. 7-0 because cash is out of the, okay. All right, uh, <clears throat> item number 14 on our agenda, our committee reports, and we start, of course, with our finance committee. And Director Morrison, will you give us our financial report, please? Get our slides up. There you go. go. 
Okay, there you go. Total revenue for United through January 31st, 2018 was $3 million. I'm sorry. Total revenue for United through January 31st, 2018 was $3,418,000 compared to 2 million. 886000 for a net revenue of $532,000. Slide two, please. Through January, United Mutual was better than budget by $601,000, primarily due to the timing of invoices and budget distribution that differs from the scheduled work for waistline remediation work in progress, Roof replacement, work scheduled to begin in September. Building structure replacement, funding for this program on a contingency basis, and to date, work has not been required. Water lines to date, and no buildings qualify for replacement based on a leak report. Slide three, please. On this pie chart, we show non-assessment revenues received to date of 157,000 by category, starting with our largest revenue generating category, golf cart, electric fee, followed by interest income, chargeable services, and laundry revenue. Slide four, please. On this pie chart, we see the expenses to date of 2,886,000, showing that our largest categories of expense are for the compensation and property taxes followed by utilities and materials. Slide five. The reserve balances on January 31st, 2018 were 22.9 million. Year-to-date contributions and interest to reserves were a million twenty-three thousand, and our year-to-date expenditures five hundred and twenty-one thousand. Okay, um, our delinquency balances for February seventy-four thousand six ninety-five. In January, 79815 so they were down $5,120, and our delinquencies in total were down five. Chargeable services, um, the balance from January to February went up 1732 and went up one case. Our resales uh, in 2017, were 73, 2018, 44. So our resales are down 22 or 39.7 percent. Our volume, um, 17 million 481, 630, compared uh, that was 2017. 2018 is 12 million 73,640. So they are down. 5,407,990 or 30.9%. Our average price, however, has gone up uh, from 239,662 to 275,015. So they're up $35,353 or 14.8%. That's my report. Okay. I'd like to point out. <clears throat> from this report that when he is giving the number of resales as opposed to last year, last year is the whole 12 months of 2017, and the what we've got for this year, which is definitely lower, is a report for two months. So yes, the number of resales are down, and the total volume is down, but we also have to remember that the inventory in the village is extremely low, and there just aren't that many units uh, that are available. Plus, by the time we get up to 12 months' worth of data for 2018, it's not going to look like this. Yes? So, is it possible to get uh, average days on the market information because that will have nothing to do with the number of counts and the dollars. 
the longer the number, the duration on the market means that people has to take extra effort to sell your, their units. Just a question. I think that's a, a question for our real estate department and not for our staff. We don't really uh, track that kind of data. Now, just listening to real estate agents and his agents in this area, they say that, that uh, it's less than a week usually that they're on the market because the demand is so big and that people can ask almost anything for their unit these days. And very few of them are on the market for a long period of time unless they're a really bad unit or they have really overpriced them. But that's, you would have to get from our real estate community, that's certainly not something that we track. I just Gary. also <clears throat> saw statistics from Laguna Niguel that their sales in total are also down uh, so I don't think it's just Laguna Woods. I think uh, a large portion of it is uh, we're pri maybe pricing ourselves out of the market. Okay. All right. Uh, our next report is from the Architectural Control and Standards Committee. Director Durrell. The Architectural Control and Standard Committee asked staff to revisit the issue of plumbing plans available to our members. We discussed the contractors must be aware that lead-based paint, along with asbestos testing, is needed to complete to be completed before any alteration work is started on a unit. Staff will inventory the standard plan and models and look at the ceiling heights of each to determine how much a program problem uh, with lower ceilings are in the United units. The committee will be discussing soffits at our next meeting this Thursday, March the 15th in the Syc Sycamore Room at 9.30. That's my report. Thank you. Uh, next report <clears throat> is from the Communications Committee. <laughs> okay, no thanks to me, but thanks to people who appeared on TV6, that would be Don and Gary and Steve and Juanita and Janie and myself and everybody does a good job, especially Don. He's very wry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, the next report is from the Executive Hearings Committee. <clears throat> Executive hearings uh, were held this month on February 22nd, and uh, we had a number of damage restoration and then quite a few of the discipline, and I certainly can't go into specific cases, but I can tell you that the <clears throat> um, largest number for February of uh, disciplinary cases that we have is <clears throat> still illegal occupancy. Illegal occupancy was up to 83 cases. We really need to be vigilant about uh, people who are living in the village illegally. That means they are not a co-occupant. That means that they have not applied for membership. That means that they have not uh, demonstrated a right to live in that unit. Uh, we also had quite a few <clears throat> um, unauthorized alterations, which we are catching because of the diligence of our alterations committee. And <clears throat> patio clutter was another one that was big. Uh, we had one up, we had 47 landscape cases. Again, we have a landscape department and a landscape committee. And if you want to do anything to your landscaping, especially in the common area, or even if you have a yellow stake area that has not been designated as that, you need to get permission. You need to come to the committee, you need to file uh, a form, so that uh, it is not uh, basically an illegal landscape issue that our landscape committee then has, our landscapers on staff have trouble working with. <clears throat> the next uh, executive hearing committee will be at nine o'clock on March 22nd. And <clears throat> due to our very diligent and wonderful compliance department, these are increasing. 
We seem to have, we have a full day's worth almost every month. Uh, and I don't think it's because there's an increase in uh, discipline matters as much as they're being caught where they never were before. Uh, Governing Documents Review Committee. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> At our January, uh, February 26th meeting, we reviewed and provided direction on the stock membership certificate. This has been a uh, controversial item that we have been looking into because we have a number of people who look at their membership certificate and say, I am automatically a member because I inherited this. They inherit a share of stock. They still need to apply for membership. Membership is not transferable. Um, and so we've looked into having two different certificates, a stock certificate and a uh, membership certificate, the pros and cons. Um, our attorney has been very uh, involved in this, and we will be discussing it again at our meeting uh, on March 26th when we have a, a proposal. Uh, we also looked at updated uh, resale documents. We're going through those, trying to make changes to just bring them up to date. We are not making substantial changes to the rules, but you'd be surprised how many still have PCM on them or things like that that need to be updated. Um, or the wrong fee schedule that was adopted two or three years ago but isn't reflected on the documents. And we will also be reviewing, finishing, or hopefully finishing, but going through the review. There are a lot of those in March. So those are the main things that will be on the agenda in, our, in March. We're, uh, April, we're going to be looking at updating the election procedures and in <clears throat> looking at the possibility of investors as purchasers and reviewing the financial qualifications again. So uh, that's coming up. Our next meeting is March 26th, and we do meet once a month. Uh, next committee report is the Landscape Committee. Director Blackwell. Hi, yes, we had no meeting this month. We will have a meeting uh, April 26th. April 26th will be our next meeting. We will be talking about a landscape manual and yellow stake programs. We will talk, be talking about putting the landscape almanac, which is usually included in the budget report, online on the website so that everybody can see what processes we use and what the interactions of the departments are. Uh, also, apparently, we have been handed over a bluebird issue, so we will be dealing with bluebird boxes and bluebird issues at that meeting also. So that will be uh, 9 o'clock, April 26th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next report is from Maintenance and Construction Committee. Director Tibbetts. Uh, <clears throat> yes, a lot of the things we talked about were discussed this morning. The handyman services went into detail. I assure you that it's, it's going to work out. If we find out we need additional people, then we will bring that up if it's needed. I think when it starts, we're gonna have a big influx of calls and it's, it's gonna settle down. But it, it uh, has worked out great in other communities and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we discussed, uh, Brad brought up about the waistline and the concrete report, so I won't talk about that. Um, we are, are supporting the hiring of a, a um, energy consultant with third and and uh, GRF. We all have the same concerns in the village, so we thought we would all work together and uh, hire a, a, a gentleman on an as-needed basis. And. Uh, the charges will be done will be paid for by all three uh, corporations. Um, the biggest discussion, I guess, was the uh, on the push Maddox. It was brought up at the request of one of our directors, and we went into detail of when we originally wrote the contract, 
uh, staff members reported on that contract, and we are ahead of schedule. We're doing fine, uh, and the committee voted to uh, keep the uh, pushmatic program as is. We have had it in place now for one year and two months, and uh, we are ahead of schedule. It's doing fine. The um, see if I've left anything out. Oh, the. Well, the dry down on, you talked about on the, and we had some discussion that we came up also this morning, is how do you, how do you pay someone five or six dollars, another one 90? And it, as Brad said, it takes a tremendous amount of staff work to come up with something. So we supported the concept <coughs> of reimbursing each dry down uh, $36, no, $32. dollars and the last item we mentioned is the installation of shepherd crooks. That's going to be done. Uh, you can see the shepherd, uh, the, the bob wire around all of the, uh, the perimeter walls of United. We are going to tear all of that out and put up shepherd crooks. We talked about this 10 years ago after uh, we had a bank robbery and the guy made the getaway by climbing our block wall and upset a lot of residents. And uh, he was caught, but uh, the residents were still upset. The ones over there by the old Vaughn's Market, uh, someone had put a, a tree log out there and they stepped right over and it's easy to get in and out. So we put shepherd crooks in that area and we also discovered that there were a lot of uh, uh, homeless people living there. And uh, so we put up the shepherd crook, <coughs> it eliminated all that problem. And for some reason, we didn't continue it. I think it was the expense. But uh, now the board, the committee has voted to uh, continue the rest of it. It'll come to the board hopefully next month and we will continue the problem and they it's a good way to keep people out that don't belong here and those shepherd crooks they are impossible to climb over and it looked a lot nicer too that's in my report <clears throat> thank you <clears throat> uh you also can report on the resident advisory committee <laughs> yeah, I was absent last month. I had uh, uh, something that came up I couldn't make, and uh, our president attended my place and gave the. Okay, our uh, cash was, was also. Was cash? There. Did you take over? Uh, I really did not. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, I can report on We don't go into. In, we don't report the individual people who uh, show up. But it is a great asset to our community. If you have a problem and you think that you're not being treated fairly by staff or by the board, you can come to the resident advisory committee and we will, it's very informal, and we will listen to everything you have to say and we will give you guidance that you may not like, but we'll give you the guidance that follows proper procedure. And it's, if you have a concern, attend. It's, a, it's made up by three or four uh, board members, two or three residents, and uh, a staff member. And we are good listeners. <laughs> so attend. That's the big thing. A lot of people don't feel that they're being listened to, and three minutes <clears throat> of a meeting is not enough. So come to the Resident Advisory Committee, and <clears throat> we will listen to you for however long you want to, uh, to tell us. All right, let's look at number 15, which is the GRF committee highlights. Uh, <clears throat> Director Morrison, the Finance Committee. Our last meeting was February 21st. We did not have a meeting last month. Our next meeting will be April the 18th, 2018. Okay, you might mention that at the last meeting we did the uh, KPMG. <clears throat> I thought you had a couple slides on that. I don't. Okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Do you uh, want it was it was the GRI Finance Committee, and basically Merrill Lynch, KPR, and Jacob their semi annual report and where we are with our investments, et cetera. <clears throat> Well, that wasn't KPMG. That would have been Black. That was Rock. the audit room. Yeah, Black there was Rock. both. I'm sorry, we had both. <laughs> yeah. Do you want something on BlackRock? That's a year from BlackRock. <laughs> what? You do want? Yeah. To... Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was just looking at uh, the agenda item. Okay. <laughs> um, BlackRock basically is stating that the inflation appears. Uh, like it's going to reawaken as price pressures elsewhere are minimal. Um, the outlook debate is they believe that there is low market volatility, it can persist amid stable economic backdrop, that even a small uptick in, in uh, volatility could upend the leveraged income strategies and spook the markets. And they see few signs of leverage building in the financial system. Market views, rising profitability, powering equity returns, and those are especially in the European markets, which we're not involved in. Um, they expect global economic growth to chug along in 2018, see less room for upside surprises to lift the markets. Um, many investors that were scared by the 2008 market decline has led them to save more as a buffer against future economic shocks, and thus there's a glut of precautionary savings, which puts a premium on lower risk bonds, anchoring the interest rates at low levels. Um, the risk gauge suggests that there is room for investors to embrace more risk. The emerging, emerging markets are at an earlier stage of expansion, voting well for emerging market assets. Uh, 2017 will be a tough act to follow. We believe investors uh, will still be compensated for taking risk in 2018, but will receive lower rewards. Um, current low volatility. Uh, regime can last against a backdrop of steady economic growth. They do not see, uh, in government bonds, uh, do not see a yield curve flattening as a sign of economic trouble ahead. Uh, they they uh, prefer an up in equity stance in credit amid high spreads, low absolute yields, and poor liquidity. Thank you. And I, and I apologize. We did have a meeting also for the audit schedule, select audit committee, KPMG. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm just looking at the wrong thing here. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, a report of the Community Activities Committee. Director Durrell. The CAC committee discussed bluebird houses. <laughs> It was really an interesting discussion. and the, For GRF. <laughs> excuse me, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Houses in the GRF area and the discussion for United will be handled by the Landscape Committee. The pickleball courts were approved, and the next step will be an approval for the GRF board. Up and coming events for recreation, the St. Patrick's Dinner at Clubhouse 5, March the 17th at 5 o'clock in the evening. Easter hopping at the Equestrian <coughs> Center, Saturday, March 31st at 10 a.m. Easter Buffet, Clubhouse 5 at 1 p.m. And the Village Games are starting April the 8th. Opening ceremonies at Clubhouse 2. Registration began, began yesterday at the Fitness Center. So if anybody's interested in registration, be sure you get your registration and everything that you need. And you know when you pay the entry fee, you'll also get a really a nice T-shirt. I'm sorry, I don't know what the color is this year. Um, and the next meeting of CAC will be May 10th at 2 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Uh, the Maintenance and Construction Committee, Director Tibbs. Yeah, the pickleball, as uh, Janie said, the pickleball courts have finally gone through uh, all of the committees. It's going to go to GRF next. We've been talking about this for at least 10 years, and it, it's finally been approved. The lawn bowling greens 
have been completed. They're beautiful. I, I can't figure out how they have such a large, large area over there, completely smooth and, and flat. You can, it, there's no curves at all on that thing. It, it, they did a beautiful job. Uh, the per Performing Arts Center, the Oak Clubhouse 3, that's still uh, uh, in the planning stage. Hopefully, planning will be approved uh, uh, this year and with construction starting uh, next year. Um, see, Brad talked about the gates, the pools, and the roofs, so I'm through. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> for our, our residents out there, I might mention that the pickleball issue that was at CAC and maintenance and construction is not to do the new ones at gate 16. Right. It is completely <clears throat> redoing what is existing at gate 12. So, and at much, much less yes. amount of money. All right, uh, Media and Communications Committee, Director Blackwell. Okay, we met uh, February 15th, and we discussed a scoop, which is a new feature on the website, although at currently it doesn't have anything on it. This is a rumor control, basically, or rumor response system. It is, uh, it's like Snopes. As an example of a re resource to go to to get correct information about rumors and schemes online. And the scoop could be this for the village. Uh, if directors and committee members encounter rumors, residents should be directed to the scoop. And staff will answer that question. That would be like, is gate four going to be closed like that happened one time? Yeah. And so on and so on. And the police thing would have been on the scoop. So it is just like, it can be done 24-7. They can update it from, the staff can do it from, from their hand phones. So it's a really good <coughs> system. Um, it's just a way of getting out information immediately to stem any misunderstandings or concerns or misconceptions. And it will also link to other items on the website, say for more information, see this. And so that, that's a really good new plan. Um, we uh, discussed, of course, the village TV and media logos, so that they're working on that. And if you talk to Chuck Holland about all they're doing, uh, he'll give you a 40-minute report. I mean, they are so active over there, I can't believe it. Um, I will mention that the Fox channels, somebody asked if we could renegotiate that. Uh, Fox is done with negotiating that. Uh, we now have 18 months until we can look into a renewal renegotiations. And of course, we will come up with a, a an offer and see what we can do at 18 months. But but that's on the side. We're now under no contract with Fox, but they will not be ready to speak to us again for 18 months. So that's for that. Um, Thrive is a big issue right now for the Media and Communications Committee. Thrive is a program of 30-minute spots on the Television 6. The mission of Thrive is to capture and share moments of life in the village, inspiring quality life for this very chapter of our lives. Um, they are people who are interviewed and videoed to explain how their activity helps them thrive, in other words, maintain a healthy lifestyle in the village. The spots have been done by swimmers, those at the <clears throat> fitness center, uh, several clubhouse for arts and crafts have been done, uh, the writers club has been active, and just various people conversing around the village. It's a very uh, uplifting, popular thing. You learn a lot about people. Uh, various members of the computer and video clubs have created these programs. And in the future, club presidents will be contacted to see if there is an interest of members of their club or activity 
uh, having a video session made of them so that they can explain how this will help the residents of the village to be connected and active mentally and spiritually and physically in so many ways. This is what we have to offer with all our clubs and activities. This is what we offer. The purpose is to have residents find a positive place to expand their horizons and make new friends. And most of the clubs in their 30 minutes, they will give you the name or the face of a person to, if you walk into the fitness center, look for this person. And this person will kind of monitor you around and, and introduce you to people and so on. And the various clubs will do the same thing. So this is a really a very positive thing, which is on the move. Thank you. OK. <coughs> Mobility and Vehicles Committee, Director uh, uh, Madam President, there was no meeting since the last report uh, to report. <clears throat> the next meeting is April 4th at 1.30 p.m. in the room. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> report of the Security Activities Committee. Security and Community Access Committee, excuse me. Uh, Director Tibbetts. Just a couple of items. <clears throat> you might be interested to know that the number one crime in the village is petty theft. <clears throat> and many of those items show up later, so they've just been misplaced. But uh, that's number one. Uh, we, we have a safe community, we really do. And it's becoming safer with uh, the shepherd crooks that I mentioned. And uh, that's gonna help. Um, we had a lar large, uh, long discussion on the use of uh, different stickers on the cars or your golf carts. We, they uh, are going to come up with uh, uh, decals that cannot be stolen. Many people, and I don't know why, I guess to save money, they will take your golf cart sticker, peel it off, and put it on their own. Okay, the new decals will not allow that. You, you start to peel them off, they're gonna come off in pieces. So that will be, uh, it's something, hopefully, next month or two months at the latest. Another thing with golf carts, I mentioned to you two, three months ago that I received a citation for having a, a battery charger cable on cement. Uh, and they called it an, an extension cord. So I complained about that. Now, the new policy, you still have the extension cords. Plus, it's worded out, also, you have battery cords. None of them can be on the cement. They have to be at least six inches high. And I've always taken care of mine. Just put a hook on, hook and hold it up, it's simple. Uh, and that would prevent a lot of corrosion in your battery charger also. Um, that was about it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the traffic hearings, Director Archkar. Yeah, uh, the, there were two sessions. One was morning, one was afternoon. There were a total of 32 people were cited, and 19 were either pardoned, suspended, for, or their fines were reduced for various reasons. Our security is doing an excellent job in keeping our community safe, clean, and always vigilant. One suggestion was in the area of ripped RV covers, which reduce the appeal in the RV lot for everyone. Security is very diligent on citing violators. Yet, the board felt that maybe a warning issue be issued first rather than direct citation, as RV owners don't generally visit the RV until they need it. So security is on the other hand, visits the RV lot on a regular basis and spot the tour covers oftentimes before the owner scan. So an attempt is being made to, org to organize, is being organized to issue warnings first for ripped covers, et cetera, in the RV lot and provide a two week notice to the owners to correct the situation. So we'll have more to report on that next. The next meeting is again, two schedules, morning and afternoon. <coughs> Uh, 9 a.m. March 21 in boardroom and 1 p.m. in the Cypress Room. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, <clears throat> agenda item 16, our future agenda items. We, at this time, have two items uh, that we are putting on the April agenda. One is to entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for closets and interior partition walls. As you know, every month or so, we try to update our alterations manual uh, and make things as standard as possible so that people don't have to go through a variance, alteration, cost, and uh, procedure. And we also will entertain a motion to introduce a resolution establishing a policy application for co-occupants. As has been mentioned before, co-occupants are a problem in this village, not just in United, but also in Third. Uh, <clears throat> originally, co-occupants were to be spouses, domestic partners, dependent children. And over the years, it has widened and widened to my friend down the street in Laguna, Niguel, who wants to play golf here. So uh, we're looking at what we need to do to make sure that the co-occupants, uh, it's more in third than us for, are just not renters or, or roommates. So uh, that will be on the agenda next time. All right, number 17, director's comments, and I'll start over here with director <coughs> Armendariz. No, I have no comments, uh, and I think we had a very efficient meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Director Arbitrary. Uh, I want to say uh, good wishes to our Steve Leonard, who is departing. He did an excellent job, and... Uh, I wish uh, it wasn't anything that I said that may have hurt you. <laughs> and if it did, I will always apologize. Thank you. It was a good meeting. Okay. Uh, Director Trong? Uh, I'm just uh, surprised that um, my request for raw data of uh, uh, information got rejected. I don't see that as a confidential. I don't see that as a private. I don't see that as privilege. I don't see that as uh, violating decisions. I don't see that as a, a conflict of interest. So it doesn't meet any of the criteria of saying no, but uh, we didn't even go for any decision, just say no. So uh, I don't know what does this uh, director access to corporate books, records, document has any meaning to director's request. Absolute right. And I'm just my comment. Director Tibbetts. Yeah, I also would like to mention about Steve. I hate to see Steve go. He and I have worked closely this year on the MC committee, and he does his homework. He's always prepared. He's an articulate guy, intelligent man, and he's extremely helpful. I just hate to see him go. I will miss him. <clears throat> Director Drell. <laughs> You said what I was going to say, but I'm going to say, come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> Director Blackwell. Thanks. I don't want you to go either. And I want you to, before, you, before you're allowed to turn your cards in, you have to find a suitable replacement. <laughs> 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 Director Morris. Good meeting, and I have to ditto everything that everyone said about Steve, and he's been a tremendous help to me. Um, he delves into everything and comes up with statistics and all kinds of background information that is extremely helpful, and I want to thank you. Director Leonard, any last words? In honor of National Good Samaritan Day oh, today, no. <laughs> I would like to suggest that everyone watching and present do something for someone else today. Thank you. Very good. Uh, and, and, and again, we will miss you, but we wish you the best of luck with your new endeavors. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so we will recess to our closed session. Thank you.